Um, you now can invite your panelists if you have the names with you. You take yes, the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, facilitator. It's an honor and privilege to be here and to moderate uh, the second panel of these technical sessions. Um, the second panel will be talking about domestic coffee consumption in Africa. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Adugma Debele. He was also a member of the first panel discussions, and we know why. It, Ethiopia is a, very, is, is a giant in, in, in coffee, cons and coffee production, as well as uh, uh, coffee consumption. Please have a seat. Um, it's my also a pleasure to welcome um, uh, Dr. Benson Apuyo. Welcome. Uh, he is the Deputy Director of Agriculture and Food, Food Authority in Kenya. Welcome, sir. And then you have Mr. Um, Oliver Ndengwa, who is the Managing Director of Coffeeology Espresso Culture Limited here in Kenya. So please have a seat. So ladies and gentlemen, um, join me in welcoming our three panelists by a round of applause. <laughs> we'll have three presentations, one after the other, and then we'll open for discussions, additions, or comments right after. Uh, I will start with uh, Dr. Um, Adugna Debele. He was uh, introduced in the first panel. But it will be my pleasure to reintroduce him again. He's uh, a senior horticulturalist uh, who received his bachelor's degree from Jima University and his master's and PhD from Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Uh, previously, he, uh, he was employed as a lecturer at Jima University and served as um, head of department of horticulture and plant sciences and has been teaching in different universities at the capacity of associate professor. He published more than uh, 25 articles on national and reputable journals. He also served uh, Ethiopian Horticulture and Agri Agriculture Investment Authority, first as a deputy CEO and then CEO. Currently, he's uh, working as director general of Ethiopian Coffee and Tea Authority and is president for Ethiopian Horticulture Science Society. He's a reviewer of different international journals and he's also an active member of International Society for Horticultural Science, Coffee Science, and other scientific societies. With these viewers, I invite you to the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for introducing me again. And uh, it's also my privilege to be back for, uh, in order to just share the experiences that we have in uh, domestic coffee consumption. So, uh, Ethiopia, coffee is a social fabric for uh, Ethiopia people, and it's not possible to really separate Ethiopia from coffee and the coffee from Ethiopia. So, we're very much happy to share the experience that we have in uh, coffee consumption to all African brothers and sisters. So uh, here the uh, domestic coffee consumption, uh, how we're going to just use the resource that we have in order to support the coffee producers and in order to even increase the coffee production in African continent. As, uh, as I already said this morning, Africa is a birthplace for uh, both the Robusta and the Arabica, and Africa is also uh, privileged to give coffee to the, to the world in general, but it's not consuming coffee, it's not producing coffee to the potential, and we are not actually using this comparative advantage that we have. So the geographical position where we are and the uh, naturally endowed resources that we, are, we got uh, we are not fully exploited in order to really support the Africa as a continent. So uh, the productions that we supply to the international markets 
is currently about 13% of the world coffee production. But how much of that coffee is consumed by the coffee producing country, particularly in Africa, is something to be answered and something to be worked on in order to really use the resource that we have. Uh, the other coffee, the non-coffee producing countries, they drink a lot, but we all export our coffee to the uh, international market, whether the prices is high or low. Sometimes we dump our products when the price is going down because we are not consuming, we are not using the coffee that we produce. So uh, we use a little uh, what we produce but that a lot of amount, a lot of, or amount of coffee is exported to the international market. If you see this graph, the largest coffee pro, uh, consumer in the world is Europe, so they do not produce much, but they consume much, and Africa consumes only 13% of the coffee that is entirely provided or supplied to the international market. So that is not to mean that the coffee producing countries, the 25 coffee producing countries is not used, it's not to mean we are using about 30%. The, of the Asia, what do you call it, the Egypt, Algeria, Morocco, all the other uh, countries are also importing coffee from the international market. That's all totaled to 30% of the total international market coffee. So while no country in Africa is a top 10 consumer, the uh, Europe, the Asian Pacific, the North America, the South America, they are all the top co coffee consuming countries. But Africa, as a coffee producing country, we are not using our own resource uh, to support our own farmers. So we produce more, than, we contribute about 30% of coffee to the international market, but we still import about 30% of coffee from the international market. So look how much costs that we are really incurring in order to just get the readily available coffee uh, uh, re-imported by the, produce, the exporting countries. The, we, are, we are lucky enough that Africa is as a continent, is the largest second continent in population, but we're not using this opportunity in order to exploit or use coffee that we produce because we do not consume coffee People prefer tea to uh, coffee for drinking. About 70% of coffee that is brought to the international market is entirely consumed by non-producing countries. So here, the coffee consumption in Africa, the ICO has already averaged how much is the coffee consumption or the average coffee consumption for, uh, per, per, per the countries. That is the uh, average coffee consumed per country is about 30%, but the African continent is consuming less than the average coffee consumption that was actually rated by the ICO. So still, we need to work much in order to use our own resources rather than dumping elsewhere without just getting any benefit from the crop. If you consider these are some of the graphs, thank you for USDA for uh, developing and figuring out all the coffees that we produce and how much coffees that we drink. Look, Ethiopia, we produce about seven to eight million uh, bucks every year and we, pr we drink 50% of our coffee. And this is really a comparative advantage because when the price is going down, we, we, we are we are just having the chance to use that coffee here in the country without just dumping at a very lower prices. But the trend indicates here that there is continuous increment or growth in coffee production, coffee consumption in our country, Ethiopia too. But the rate at which the coffee production or consumption increase is, is negative. So the trend is showing positive. That means the consumption showing positive but the rate at which this consumption increases is, is very negative. I will show you in a minute. Uh, that is Ghana. At some point in time, the, pro the co coffee consumption in Ghana was very promising. And between the early 90s, the coffee consumption in Ghana has gone a lot. But currently, look, the coffee consumption in Ghana is now going down. So uh, there is a number of initiations have been taken by the Ghanaian government 
in order to really promote domestic coffee consumption there, still something has to be done in order to really improve here. Nigeria is the largest population that we have. There was high promising coffee consumption in Nigeria at, in a, a, number, a decade ago, but the coffee consumption in Nigeria is still going down. So not only the rate at which this consumption is increasing, but the consumption itself is also going down. So largest population we have, but we have not yet exploited the opportunity that we are really given. Uh, that is the Kenyan. Still, there is a positive trend for the, from uh, the Kenyan set. There is also the oscillating coffee drinking pattern or consumption pattern, but still there is a high opportunity and gap to be filled in order to increase the coffee consumption in Kenya uh, too. The, sorry, the other is Rwanda, and that one is in Uganda. You see how the coffee consumption pattern is really varying from country to country, but there is still a promising chance for Ugandan people to further exploit the coffee consumption, and I hope Dr. Emmanuel is here. He will be taking the assignment to further work on the initiations as they have already uh, started. This is Congo, and that is Tanzania. So still, the coffee consumption in the country is there, but the way how we are promoting and the way or the rate at which we are actually using coffee consumption in Africa is, is not really very promising. So we need to further work in order to exploit our own resources. So this is the, the, the first one is the pattern how that coffee is increasing or consumed in Africa, but this is the, pro, the future rate and showing the direction how much is the percentage of increase in coffee consumption in Africa too. Look, the first panel, this is coffee consumption increment rate in Ethiopia. If there is a positive trend or increment in Ethiopia, the rate at which the coffee consumption increase is, is zero. So it's, it's stagnant. We, last year it was 50% of our consumption. The year before it was about 50% of our consumption, our production. This is also is about 50% of our production. That means the rate at which coffee consumption increases already stopped or is stagnant. So that shows the zero increment means there is no further increment, but still those people who are having the, the culture of drinking coffee, they are still drinking, but there are no more increment from the other side. The Ghana, this, as you can see all from the, all other countries, the Nigeria and the Kenya, the rate at which the consumption increases, they are all zero. So still we have to work on how to further popularize the youngest or engage the youngest in order to make use of the uh, resources that we have so that we can drink our own coffee here. We can also popularize our own coffee rather than simply exporting coffee to the international market. And this is for Rwanda and that is for Uganda and this is for Congo and also for Tanzania. You see the average, price, the average rate almost leveled at zero level. So that was, what does that mean? There is a, a tendency for increment, but the rate at which the production or the consumption is increasing needs some, some sort of interventions in order to promote coffee consumption in uh, Africa. So you see most of the time, there is high fluctuation of coffee prices in international markets. Ethiopia has a comparative and a competitive advantage when the price is going down like this. We use our resource, we can also consume coffee, and to some extent, we save our farmers from being affected by such fluctuating prices in the international market. But the fluctuation of prices like this, for example, the graph down there, the bar graph down there indicates how much payback the farmers do get from the coffee that they are exporting. The first graph, the first bar graph is from Vietnam. The farmers, they get about 19% of the FEOB prices. Ethiopia hardly gets 40%. Now we are working on how to increase the payback of the farmers, either by increasing the local consumption or improving the quality of in, uh, the Ethiopian coffee to be sold at higher prices. The 
policy reforms that we've made this morning, I showed you this morning, supported us or allowed us to uh, export direct, the, the farmers directly export their coffee to the international market so that the benefits they are now getting to some extent is improved. So this encouraged them to produce much more coffee than the previous one. So 92-95% is paid for the Vietnam farmers, but less than 40% is paid to the, the Ethiopian farmers. So we are going now changing this pattern, and Ethiopian farmers should also get about 90% of the coffee, the prices that is paid to the international market. So in that case, either producing larger proportion of coffee with a very good quality, and are still promoting the, the domestic consumption. These are some of the interventions as an Ethiopian government that we are working on in order to support our own farmers. So the small order farmers, they are against this, the, the, the green coffee price volatility. And we are not price maker, of course, like what this gentleman already said this morning. We are price takers. So what we are using as an intervention Especially this price fluctuation is for the commercial coffee. We have changed our system to the specialty coffee market. So if we move to the specialty coffee market, we're, not, we're hardly affected by the, the price fluctuation of the commercial market. So most of our coffee that we have exported this year is mostly specialty coffee. And for your information, in history, Ethiopia got a billion plus dollar from coffee. So this is something that we have already seen by intervening or bringing such kind of intervention into our coffee sector. So in order to support our farmers, we need to promote the domestic consumption that is a must for us. There are a number of ongoing efforts. I have tried to just figure or search for uh, Uganda, Rwanda, Kenya, and something like that. The Tanzania Coffee Board, they are here already at and they have already started some initiation to promote coffee, uh, the domestic coffee consumption in Tanzania. That's very good, and they are in a very good trajectory, so it has to be further worked on. The Rwandan National Agriculture Export Development Board, they are also doing their level best in order to promote the, coffee do the domestic coffee consumption in Rwanda. This is also something that needs to be appreciated. The Uganda Development Authority, they are also as a leading company, they are also working their level best in order to promote coffee consumption in, uh, in Uganda. The opening of a number of factors like uh, Java and uh, other coffee in uh, Kenya is also something to indicating the positive uh, direction for the coffee consumption or domestic, increasing coffee domestic consumption in uh, Kenya. The Nigerian, they started to consume much more coffee. This is also very promising because as a, the country having much more population, so investing in Nigeria for us is a plus point and is a comparative advantage for African countries. In Kenya, coffees like, for example, Art Cafe and the Java Houses, this also allows the, the Kenyan population to drink much more coffee in, uh, and retain their own coffee here in the country. We, we, Ethiopia is consuming about 50% of the coffee that we produce. Yes, we are also doing our level best to increase the, the consumption pattern and also the, the rate at which the, the consumption increases. But as a country looking for foreign currency, we need to also uh, focus on how to further exploit that potential too. These are uh, some things that I'd like to share with you uh, regarding the coffee consumptions. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'll be available for any questions and the question requests that, the, that you have in mind. Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, Dr. Dubna, um, for um, showing dynamics uh, of increasing domestic coffee consumption, not only in Ethiopia, but also in other African countries and what it requires uh, in terms of investment, but also uh, knowledge sharing among countries to take advantage um, of increasing uh, domestic consumption. So thank you very much. So our second panelist is, uh, as I said earlier, is Dr. Benson Apuyo. Um, he's the Deputy Director at the Agriculture and Food Authority in Kenya. It's a government uh, parastatal. 
under the Minister of Agriculture, Livestock, Fisheries and Cooperatives. He is the head of market research and product development at Coffee Directorate. Uh, Benson, Dr. Benson holds a PhD degree in finance from Kenyatta University, specializing in entrepreneurship finance, a master's of business administration degree, specializing also in finance uh, from University of Nairobi, and a bachelor of commerce degree, a marketing option from University of Nairobi. He has over 30 years of experience in the coffee industry, uh, having worked from the Minister of Agriculture, Livestock, and Marketing, uh, the, coffee, uh, the former coffee board of Kenya, and now the Agriculture and Food Authority. Uh, Dr. Benson has a wide experience in, in, in marketing, trade promotions, and entrepreneurial inter, financing. Dr. Benson is also uh, passionate about promotion of coffee, uh, uh, sorry, uh, domestic coffee consumption. He has written papers and made presentation on domestic coffee consumption uh, in a number of conferences, meetings, seminars, and lectures including Ethiopia uh, and Zanzibar in Tanzania. Uh, Dr. Benson has also uh, spearheaded uh, the certification process of Kenya coffee as the mark of origin whose brand name is known as uh, Coffee um, Kenya. So Dr. Benson, the floor is yours. I would like to take this opportunity first to thank the <coughs> Inter-Africa Coffee Organization for making uh, an invitation to me to make this presentation and also share the Kenyans' experience in the world of coffee consumption. Uh, <coughs> mine is just to give the Kenyan experience how have we grown as a country, and where are we right now? So, <clears throat> I'm going to give a fairly brief uh, presentation. Most of this has been covered by my uh, predecessor, who has just talked about the consumption. I'd like to share with you uh, the paradox of the coffee. Coffee is a, a crop which has got is, uh, a lot of paradox. And I want to show you in the map they are showing the areas where coffee is being grown. And you'll find that over 90% of, co of the global coffee production is done in the southern region of the hemisphere, while consumption takes place in the northern hemisphere. That is one aspect of the paradox of coffee. You grow it, but you find that the other part of the global surface is the one where consumption takes place. Another paradox is that these low coffee prices to the countries that produce coffee, and therefore you find that they const all the time they keep on saying that there are no returns on coffee production. But the paradox of that is that you find in consuming countries, the price of a cup is high. So coffee prices for a cup in importing countries, they are high. That is another paradox on this particular commodity. Then another one is about the production, consumption pattern. Provide some kind of uh, insights, this iniquity. And then we also have the north-south 
kind of economic relation. So all these ones create some paradox around, the, around this crop called coffee. You'll find in the lower coffee belt, uh, if you draw the map of equator, you'll find that most of the production takes place uh, southern of the equator. Of course, we have some other countries that do uh, production in the upper part of it, but most of the consumption, as I've said, takes place in the northern part of the hemisphere. Now we should interrogate ourselves why. Sorry. I want to share with you the global perspective on how coffee production is distributed. And among the 10 coffee producing countries, the top 10, Africa is only number five, where Ethiopia produces around 4.5% of the, I mean, produces around 7.5 million bags. And then we have Uganda which has also tried. So in the top 10 countries, you'll find that only two countries are captured. And in the top 10, they produce around 89%, just around 90% of their world coffee supply. If I go to consumption, the global consumption keeps on rising. There's a demand for coffee globally. And uh, you'll find that the aggregate consumption annually when it is uh, for the world demand is about, the growth is about 1%. If you look at Africa, you find that Africa, the growth is about 3.4%. Asia and, and Oceania, 1.5%. Central America and, uh, and, and Mexico are around 0.6%. So in all, in brief, is that this, this demand and also this potential for coffee consumption in Africa. But how much have we done to exploit that as a continent? I want to share with you maybe the the chronological events that have shaped the Kenyan coffee consumption. Uh, before 1963, the crop was just to, to grow and export, no consumption. Consumption started taking place around 1970 when it was perceived as an elitist drink. Around 1977, the former Coffee Board of Kenya started the establishment of coffee houses to promote domestic coffee consumption. Unfortunately, this journey was uh, stopped. It was curtailed uh, through the SAP issues, structural, uh, structural adjustment programs that were given as palliative medicine to address the uh, political and also maybe economic woes of the Africa. And then the government was told that you don't have any business of starting coffee houses, and Coffee Board was forced to close coffee houses. So that one left a gap when we were at the takeoff stage where we could start it the country could have started the promotion of domestic coffee consumption. So in 1979, uh, 97, sorry, uh, we, the first coffee house was started again by Java, and uh, this one contributed to the growth of consumption by a number of coffee houses, and around 27 coffee houses were now available around in the year 2009. But the directorate now decided to do a survey 
and develop a strategy on how coffee consumption could be driven. And we develop a coffee consumption strategy in the year 2013. So all the gains that have been made were based on the domestic coffee consumption strategy developed around 2013 in the country. So these are some of the steps that have been taken to drive the coffee process in the country. Uh, much of it to associate with the university. And uh, youth were identified as the key drivers through which uh, coffee consumption could be enhanced in the country. We had interaction in several universities and those are some of the forums that were held. Sorry. Now, this one gave rise to the youth. Now, they decided now to associate themselves with the coffee drinking culture in the country. And through the support of International Coffee Organization and Inter-Africa Inter Inter Coffee Organization, IACO, we were able to uh, establish two coffee houses in the country, one at Egerton University and one at Kenyatta University. Those are some of the uh, opening ceremonies that were undertaken. If you look at that table, you'll see that there's some growth that have been realized, but they are not all that good. From the year 2010, from 2009 to 2010, our consumption level was one point about one, two of our national production. Through consistent promotion, up to the year 2020, 2021, we were able to grow that one to about 4.8 percent. This is because of the publicity done and also leveraging on the numerical strength of the youth in the institution of, Kenya, of higher learning in the country. We want to consume coffee in Africa, but allow me to present a case scenario on where does this coffee go? Almost over 90. 5% of Kenyan coffee is exported. So that is the market. And you find that in the top 10, we don't have even a country from Africa which imports coffee in high volume. And that one is a challenge. So we as policy setters, policy makers, implementers, we have got an uphill, an uphill task to see where can we position Kenyan coffee or African coffee in terms of co consumption. Now, how much, in the Kenyan's perspective, how much or how, where, how many countries do we export coffee to? In terms of, in the African destinations, the one which is doing well is Tunisia, Djibouti, and just around 11 countries that import coffee from Kenya. But this is a paltry because you'll find that it is less than, it is just in total, in one particular year, it is 8,000. The highest was about in the year 2020. 18, 2019, where we exported about 23,000. Then the trend has been declining from 23, it went to 17, to 5,000. That is in the continent of Africa to last year, where it was 2,000. So do we really have the potential? That is the question. Do we really have the potential? Now, let us look at if Kenya is exporting to those countries, do we have import from other countries into the country? 
Yes, we do. In the year 2019, we imported 157 bags. But in the year 2020-2021, the import was very high from a number of countries from Africa, led by Rwanda. So what does that one show? If there's minimum amount of export of Kenyan coffee to the rest of African countries, while there's a lot of import of coffee from the rest of African countries into the country. Is this coffee being consumed in the country or is it on transit? In Kenya we do what is called, for us to validate the information, we do what is called the domestic coffee consumption survey after every two years. And right now we have the latest which was done in the year 2021-2022, the current year, we have about 506 coffee houses in the country. And we have they are apportioned according to the counties and the locality of the towns in which they operate. So these are operational 506 coffee houses. If you look at the number of coffee houses, the way they have been grown in the country, this is the graphical representation of how coffee houses have grown, which means that there is a potentiality of coffee consumption, there's a demand for coffee consumption in the country. These are the number of green coffee bean equivalents that have been consumed in the country for over a period of 12 years. And it shows that there is demand. Graphical representatives, it is growing. And these one are value-added coffee, excluding coffee which is instant. These are some of our partners, as I said earlier, that the youth are the driving force of coffee consumption in the country. We have targeted the, uh, the universities to help in the campaign, and we have shared quite a number of experiences with the youth. And we have five universities have taken lead. Did and Kimathi, they do much of it, they do Valadison. But United States International University of Africa, Strathmore University, Egerton University, and Kenyatta University, these are institutions of higher learning where you go, you can get coffee and youth have been enticed and they like coffee. We have about nine universities in the country that are in the waiting list and they are requesting if coffee houses could be established. Leading on the waiting list is University of Nairobi. The critical path that has helped, helped us to move and work in together with the universities is participation in the event. When they organize, we go. They do and make invitation. We also have meetings with the vice chancellors we also have the link person, and sometimes these universities, when they make approach and they visit other universities, they usually see coffee houses and they say ideas through word of mouth. Then where are the opportunities? The, the opportunities lie in the quantity, quality, price. The opportunity also lie in the uh, uh, innovation, improved supply system, simplification of the procedures, You also lie on <clears throat> if you can leverage on the AFCA. AFCA of late has not been active, and this is the trade wing part, the counterpart of Inter Africa Coffee Organization, AFCA, because it's the trade part. But the price, we have to know how we do the pricing. Another element is that if the procedures are too complicated, it will be, very, it will be challenging for you to for the trade to take off, and also the target market. 
We have also relied on the youth at the target market. That is the niche market has, that has driven the Kenyan coffee and also the elite. Uh, of course, you cannot target the mass marketing in coffee because of other factors. And that is where the price comes in. And lastly, important on this is the innovation. If you don't invent, you don't do innovation, then you may not be able to entice the niche market into the, uh, to the product. So we have some challenges as we do that, and these challenges need to be addressed. As we are going to venture into the inter -Africa, intercontinental Africa uh, <coughs> free trade area, we must remember that there are existing trade agreements and we policymakers, we must be alive to that, how they can be addressed so that we don't, we don't meet the roadblocks. Then we also have the treaties which are already there. And also, how do we confront our, you want to go to the area where your competitors is having the product. What is the strategy you are going to use? You are going to attack the people who are well established, the multinational who are established in the industry. Are you going to give the frontal attack? Are you going to give the lethal attack? So we have to strategize and know which area to strike. Otherwise, we might not make a comment. Uh, lastly, I would like to say that uh, Kenya has gained, it has made some steps, and the most important thing for us is to enhance the strategy and leverage on the policy issues. Other, I thank you very much, and that marks the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Benson, for enlightening us uh, on coffee paradox. Um, why you mentioned that uh, production takes place in Southern Hemisphere, but at the same time, uh, producing countries are, are price takers. Uh, this is a very strong message. Um, you've also shown evidence on trends of coffee consumption and production in Africa, as well as destinations of origins of coffee, um, of Kenyan coffee. And you ended with opportunities in terms of technology, innovation, um, as well as uh, markets. So thank you very much. Uh, last but not least, we have a, our third panelist. Um, our, our panelist today, our third panelist is uh, uh, Mr. Oliver Ndegwa. He is a group um, managing director of Coffeeology Espresso Culture Limited in Kenya. He is a software engineer by profession with the uh, with the BS in Applied Business uh, Computing and head of different companies as an entrepreneur. He's the managing director of, uh, director of Triple Pline, a communication limited. He's the founder of Willow Garden, a continental restaurant. He's the founder of Coffeeology Special Culture Limited. He's a father and a husband. He has interest in developing markets and placing coffee as a sustainable product which can help uh, coffee growers to alleviate poverty as means to proper income generation. He has worked previously with a Danish company uh, called Metrocomia as a software engineer and for Radio Africa Group as Group ICT and Broadcasting Manager. Mr. Ndengo, the floor is yours. Okay, um, my moderator and fellow delegates, good afternoon. Must be afternoon. Good afternoon. I want us to make this uh, 15 minutes I'm given very different from what we have had in the previous presentation. And I know one of the questions all of us would ask is, what is a software engineer doing in front of coffee growers and government officials who take care of the coffee sector or agriculture for that matter. But I will tell you, in our own small world where we operate, 
uh, we are one of your biggest customers. When we work in our software engineering and tech companies, we are one of the biggest consumers of coffee because we know the value it gains when we sit behind our screens and put in a lot of energy and time creating solutions so that we can automate the businesses that you do. But that's not the reason why I'm here. Today I want to paint a, a very different picture. We have the numbers, we have the statistics, we have everything it takes and you have done very well. As, an, as organizations in your different countries, you have placed coffee where it should be in terms of production and now we are thinking about increasing production. But what about, what does it take? What is the actual value proposition at the end of the value chain? Where do we create the value? How much of that is becoming part of our daily growth? So that when our parents toil back at home, making sure that that coffee gets out of the farm in the best quality, it goes to the mill, it goes to the roaster, it goes to the, to the marketers, and it comes to the end where the hospitality, hosp I mean, a, I mean a hotel like this picks up and starts using it. So we have a chance to actually consume coffee during our coffee breaks. Have we thought about the business value proposition that la that has to offer so that our own children, because the reason why we're here is so that we can take this two, five, ten steps, 15, 20 years from now, that our own children can actually earn a decent living out of the product that we are working so hard on. Now, uh, part of the organization that I formed three years ago is called Coffeeology. And one of the things that was a driving force is when I decided to get into hospitality, we needed to look at, at a scenario where we can actually look at coffee as a real business that can actually give us a real decent livelihood without overthinking about export, about so many other things that we are all looking at uh, European Union and European markets, American markets. What about us? And today I want to give you a very short story. And this story is purely based on a business that starts from nothing and in a very short time amidst so many uh, obstacles, including COVID, ends up becoming something that we can all emulate and see. Okay, I want to be able to see. So, uh, in 2019, I made a decision to start a small restaurant or a coffee shop for that matter. And during the same time, it was a small uh, shop in the middle of uh, UN Avenue, probably thinking I could sell maybe a cup of coffee or tea, but I didn't even have an idea what it means to express coffee or sell coffee. I didn't even know what kind of machine I would need for me to do that. It's one of those things you go into blindly and start doing a menu engineering and think you will do. At the end of 2019, I was moved from one section to another, and I was actually able to move to a small coffee, I mean, to a small food court where I could be able to serve maybe 10, 15 people seated, and I could offer lunch and probably uh, black coffee the regular one we know probably from Sachets and whatever at the end of at four o'clock. And of course, you know what happened in 2020, there was COVID. And then out of other, many other government factors, we were actually forced to close down and move from UN Avenue. And now you can imagine at that point, everyone was getting out of offices. There was no one operating from uh, offices. People had to go and work from home. What does that mean in terms of a restaurant? All of us were forced to shut down. And the few who are left could only offer maybe one or two, three, four deliveries on uh, takeaway. And having that happen in such that you have a business operation and you have to shut it down in the middle of COVID, and that is probably the only livelihood you have left to feed your family, I found myself in the middle of the streets of Nairobi finding a space to open a restaurant in the middle of COVID. Now, everyone is looking at you, even the landlords are looking at you, wondering how are you going to pay me? You want to take up a space to open a restaurant in 2020? Are you out of your mind? And I told them, I am not out of my mind. I want to open a restaurant. And that's what I did. I found a car wash in the middle of Kideleshwa 
They had just opened like six months before I arrived and they had, didn't even have a property. So what do I do? At that point, I sold my car. I had a small car, I sold it. I needed to raise money to be able to put up a quick structure because there was no building and be able to start you know, serving my customers, whatever it is I can, tea, whatever it is that I can, but I needed my 100, 200 shillings to come to my pocket every day. Now, when I was building, something interesting happened. On the day I was doing a uh, first structure, and we were doing this with a lot of pallet wood. Pallet is the used wood that you use for importation. One of, uh, a French guy came, and I know very well he was from France. He came, he asked me, what are you doing? And I told him, I'm building a coffee house. Do you have coffee machines? I told him, I don't even know what those are. Can I go somewhere with you? i show you something. I told him, what does it matter? Let's go. So we ended up in an apartment where he lives, and the next 15 minutes with him changed my life. He made for me a cappuccino, which I was aware of, and I used to consume in other coffee houses. And before I left, he told me something. I'm going to give you my coffee machines, the espresso machine, the grinder, everything that I have because I don't run a cafe for four months on one condition, that you buy coffee from me. And I told him, what the hell? I just buy coffee from you. I took the machines and I went and he gave me four months. And within a period of four months, four months, I was able to buy my own two group espresso machine, buy my own grinder, everything else that comes with the coffee setup, the filters, the water filters, the implementation of, name it, at a cost of about one million shillings, which is about 10,000 US dollars. How many months? Four months. Now, why am I giving you this story? I mean, it looks like a, you know, generally a regular business story. A business starts, a business grows, it goes from one section to another. But I want you to understand at what point did the fortunes change in the business. It is when I introduced the coffee machine. And that is what I want us to put in our minds today. That at the point when I started capping the coffee from where I am, the one, two, three hundred, one hundred, two hundred coffee cups that I would actually sell in a day to people who are just driving in to wash their cars, pick one or two espressos, take a cappuccino, whatever it is, and go back home, change the fortunes. And the next picture I'm going to show you, show you exactly the journey of what I walked through and why I am right now, and all that changed because I introduced coffee as part of the continental menu that we had, we were already offering. Remember, we have grown from a small cafe offering just regular nyama choma, small, small things, to a proper uh, fine dining restaurant. Now, the first picture is us at the UN Avenue in a small uh, food court. The second picture is what we were able to put up when we started, uh, when we, when, during COVID, when we just wanted to use regular, very cheap material to set up a coffee shop. And this is when someone identified what we could be able to do. The third picture is what we were able to do when we got the, uh, when we managed, on the second picture we got a, a, an espresso machine, and on the third one we were able to put up a proper coffee house, which grew up, grew into the, into the, fourth one. So the second and third one is ground floor, the other one is uh, first floor. Two floors of a coffee setup. Now, what does it tell you? That we have a very unique opportunity that at the end of the value chain in coffee, there is an opportunity that lies there. And that is why in Kenya we have more than 15 companies from abroad trying to sell coffee to us. You know, we have not taken the opportunity ourselves and actually known that we can actually create jobs. This cafe down number three and four is employing more than 25 members of staff, permanent and pensionable. This is a scalable business. And I speak today from a private sector. We talk about scalability and a business only makes sense when you can be able to move it from one level to the next. And the challenge I'm putting across to all of us today is very simple. We can sit in, we can discuss all the things we have to do, but until we act and actually do this, and this will not be done by governments, it will be very sad to hear that 
coffee houses are being established by governments. Governments don't have funds for running business and making profit. It, it, the only thing they can do is make an enabling environment for us. And what is that? You are the coffee growers. The people who are running business are your children. Why do we have to go through a chain of custody for a product that my mother grows coffee, but I have to go through 15, 10, 15 people for me to be able to buy coffee and cap it so that my fellow colleagues or yourselves can actually access that coffee and, and use it? You know, and sorry. Let me just go to the next. So there's a mystery here. Between a farmer who gains one dollar per kilo of cherry and ourselves at the end when all the processes have gone through paying about $18 for a kilo of roasted coffee. Of course, all of you know what happens in between. Between the farmer and what happens when we buy your first kg of roasted coffee so that we can cap it. But the question is, why are you in that food chain? And when you find your space, what happens after the $18, 18 US dollar per kg? And that is where the business is. That is exactly where the business is. And I'll tell you that if you identify that opportunity, we will not be having this discussion of coffee consumption, blah, 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 because it's very simple. Right now in Kenya, we have a very unique opportunity. I think we are at a place where there is a new generation of upbeat people who are creating a new culture in coffee consumption. They know the value of coffee. It increases your productivity. It makes you remain alert. You can actually work for 24 hours if you have a deadline to meet. And when you want to sleep, you, make a, you, you take a cup of tea. That's the difference. That when you want to be creative, you want to be up and about. And if you walk into any of the software companies today in Kenya, the first thing that you smell at the door is the coffee. And it's very intentional about it. And when you become intentional about this, I would want to walk into any of your offices and actually find coffee at your table, consuming because you know these are my productive time. And the minute you do that, we don't have to we don't have to be at the mercy of you know international markets trying to sell coffee to people out there. Yet the local consumption we can't even satisfy. Imagine if we had 10 million cups of coffee capped today in Kenya in the morning when people woke up going to work wherever they work across the country. What would that mean? to farmers here who are struggling, walking around, hawking coffee in their bag bags, hoping that somebody would give them an order. That would never happen. We would be at a point where we pay our farmers on time, we give them you know, good value because at the middle of this chain, we can increase the amount that we give to our farmer and reduce the cost that goes to our, our end users, the hospitality team. And that means that in between, we can actually be able to reduce the cost of Cupping, the co cost of one cup of coffee. If you can bring that to, right now, a cup of coffee is about 100, 150 shillings, Kenya shillings, and you can reduce that to 50 bob, which means anyone out there working can actually afford that cup of coffee. All right? So, our golden bean is a ticket to unemployment. That is a fact, and I cannot overemphasize that. We have the coffee marketers, we have the people who do the roastery, we have all the value-adding processes that are out there. But at the end of it, there is real money, there is real business, there is real opportunities, real employment. And I think if we take this gospel with us and we start you know, scaling all the things that we must do, there is a lot of value, there is a lot of opportunity that I cannot overemphasize. All right? So, we say you eat your own frogs. And when you do it, you never need to beg anybody in life to pick your product because you have nowhere to sell it. If you create a local demand for the product, it means that you increase a local, increase a local demand. It means that uh, your next farmer is actually paid in time because you produce the money in cash and you pay the farmer in cash, right? It means that you create business opportunities that were not there before observing what the international market is doing in our own countries and actually commercializing the same and making it of value to us. It also means that uh, we can make our next millionaires because when you increase the cost of coffee to our farmers by another 50, you know, by another maybe 0.5 dollar, even an extra dollar, 
it means a customer, I mean a farmer who is making 100,000 can now make 200,000. What does that mean back at home? The ripple effect is out of this world. It also means that we take the pride of the work that we do and we do it so hard in our hands and actually make it our own. If you are so proud of the work you do, why would you want to uproot your own coffee? And that has happened a lot in Kenya. You walk around, there are so many estates that were uprooted. Why? Because people could not see the value of those plants. They could not, they could not see it. Because imagine, and I give you another hypothetical scenario. You come today and say when you're finishing your high school, your father gives you five, five acres of land. And after that, it is full of coffee and your work is to tender that property and make sure at the end of the season, you harvest, you sell to make money to go to the university. You're all happy and you call your friends and you get manure and everything that matters and you get three times the harvest your father have done before. You take it to the society. You go and find a society full of debt and you're told, I'm sorry, on this season you get nothing. There was so much debt to be done. The first instinct that comes to you is if you can get petrol and you just put that whole, that coffee or that product and get it through the value chain and actually even start another business with it in the same location without moving anywhere, then it means that you would even take that further and actually try and see what can you do to make this a proper business opportunity for you and the people around you and the people and, and anyone else who matter. So as I come to a conclusion, drinking, you know, helping them to design coffee shops from where they are so that they can be able to express coffee and actually share the same with the farmers. We have what we call um, taste of the harvest. Farmers need to be able to taste the coffee and understand how good a product is that they produce so that later on uh, them tendering and making sure that the quality is good so that they get in. That when you're told this grade is different from this because of factors of environment and what matters, then you're able to do it. All right? So, uh, in a nutshell, we need to be able to work together. And from the private sector, I think for us, we are always open to discussions on what can we do with you. And for us as a company, we have already gone ahead, we have created designs, we have created opportunities that even uh, the societies, the farmers, the people who want to go into business of coffee can come and tap from us. And we are very, uh, we have a lot of support from outside. Uh, of our organization on what can be done and we have given our proposals and I will only tell you that all the African countries that are represented here and I'm glad that uh, my fellow panelists from Ethiopia is one of the people who are consuming their own product. They are eating their own from same economy and it circulates and no farmer has to be held at ransom that there was no market for a product. We do it at our most convenient way. So. Uh, these are some of the centers that we're creating, small exp uh, express centers for coffee. So when you're going to work, you just stop by somewhere and you just pick a cup of coffee and you go to the office. We also creating what we call coffee corners. We come to your office, we create a small uh, coffee section, we pick your tea girl and we make them a barista. So they're able to come and they brew coffee for your board members, for your, for your management meetings, for all your staff so that during your productive time you're consuming coffee and the other time when you're going home you take a cup of tea so that you can be able to slow down and sleep. And we want to eliminate this issue of stories of, oh, you can't sleep because you're taking coffee. That's a, that's a story. I think you stop taking coffee at the point where you know you're becoming non-productive. At that point, take all the coffee you want because we also want to take the tea, it's ours also. But where do we leave the coffee when we sh which we should be consuming in time like this when we're seated? instead of just consuming water, all right? So we know that we have the best and we must make the best out of it when it really matters. So thank you so much for your time and uh, I do hope that we stay grounded like coffee. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Oliver. Um, by pointing us your role as a uh, uh, software engineer, but more in general, company um, tech, tech companies in the role of today's topic. Uh, we do understand uh, that is very crucial.
um, uh, to look at the other side of the corner, so the other, the other side of the coin in terms of allowing the private sector also um, to, 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 to um, uh, bring, you know, um, these kind of discussions uh, that you have today. But, but more importantly, um, the role of hospitality, the hospitality sector in increasing coffee culture, uh, but ultimately the coffee consumption in Africa. And um, we really thank you for you know, um, sharing your journey in, in the coffee business. So ladies and gentlemen, you've heard from our three eminent uh, panelists. We'll open up uh, the floor now for either additions uh, or, or comments, even questions so that at least we discuss more how we can take advantage of this kind of platform to discuss how to increase um, coffee consumption in Africa. So uh, as we did it in the first panel, we'll be having a set of uh, round of first questions. Um, you introduce yourself, uh, the, country, the company you work for, the, the country you're coming from, then you ask a question whether it's directed to the panelists you, you may even be able to ask a question to whoever is in the room, especially um, that uh, we have uh, the Secretary General of IACO in the room. So um, the floor is open. Uh, we will knock off around 1.30 in the afternoon, so uh, we take advantage of these 45 minutes remaining for, for this kind of this, you know, um, interactions. So I have... Uh, one hand in the middle. Excuse me. There is a gentleman. Thank you very much. Um, my name is uh, Innocent Matziwa. Um, I am a director of investment promotion from Zimbabwe. Um, I just want to thank uh, the three panelists for th those insightful presentations. I think I have um, a comment and a question. Um, I think from the paradox that, um, um, that was highlighted uh, by Dr. Benson, it's very clear that as, um, as African states, uh, we also need to promote intra-trade intra within ourselves. So I think we have to take at SG25 we have to really take advantage of um, uh, the regional groupings that we are, as well as um, um, harmonization of standards and uh, other barri barriers to intra-trade. Intra so I think as a grouping is something that we have to, to take up. Then um, I just wanted to know, uh, in terms of consumption, for our, especially from our, the, the, pre the three presenters, um, um, we, we, from the, the data that was shared, um, the consumption is growing steadily, um, but not, not really at an increasing rate. I just wanted to, to know how strong uh, is the growth in consumption um, um, of coffee um, uh, within, in the world and within the region uh, in view of um, health campaigns uh, against uh, its consumption. Thank you. That is noted. Next. Uh, thank you very much, the moderator. My name is Dr. Ambrose Jagongo, an entrepreneurship uh, finance specialist from Kenyatta University in Kenya. I start by thanking the presenters, Bwana uh, Adugna, Apoyo, and Oliver. That was nice presentation. Thank you very much. However, I have a few concerns arising from your presentations. Number one is Bwana Adugna says, compared to the others, coffee drinking has not been felt in the continent. My question then is, why and what are we doing about it? Why and what are we doing about it? Are we going to repeat the presentation like this next year and five years to come? 
Uh, I, I relate it also to the president's speech read yesterday, where it was said that uh, I think coffee is the second traded product after oil, probably in the world. I, I gathered that yesterday. I, I also picked from a poem that uh, there is a lot of potential for coffee consumption in Africa. Then I ask Bwana Poe and the presenters, with all that you have told us, do you think we have done enough? Do you think we have done enough to really tackle the potential of, for coffee consumption, which you have found is there in Africa? And then I have a concern to the Secretary General of Ayako, who is here just in front of me. And then I ask, there's a lot of data that we get in this conference and in other conferences. How do we use this important data? Buona Secretary General, how do we use this important data? Is it only song to, or music to our ears? Then after I ask those questions, I have a few suggestions. The first one I want to suggest to the Secretary General of Ayako. Can we probably think of being entrepreneurial to pre-incubation, incubation, and post-incubation of coffee consumption enterprises? I got it from Oliver that he is painfully, actually Oliver took us through a case study that looks very painful. The story, the short story that he had, he may not have been emotional about it, but it means that our youth and our small-scale entrepreneurs require assistance. From Oliver's presentation, our small-scale enterprises, the micro and medium enterprises in coffee industry, require serious attention. And ladies and gentlemen, in this house, we have the opportunity to really give this. In the incubation, sorry, in the pre-incubation, incubation, and even post-incubation of coffee consumption enterprises. This will support the youth accelerator programs and create the employment which Bwana Oliver says the golden bean is a ticket to. Bwana Oliver says it as though it is philosophical that this is a golden bean that is a ticket to employment. But the how, the how we can do it as we sit in this hall is our challenge. And that is why I'm saying that the, we, we need to support the youth enterprises in this industry. Another suggestion that I may want to have is can we establish more coffee houses? Again, with coffee brewing machines in our institutions. More. I am using the word more because when I, uh, Dr. Apoyo took us through some institutions that uh, the AFA is trying to engage with in Kenya, and I am happy to report that I am from Kenyatta University, where Agriculture and Food Authority, through the Coffee Directorate, has actually helped to establish a coffee house. But I would report immediately that it is not enough. I would report immediately that it is not sufficient. Where we are here today, we may use such case studies to see how we can expand them, to see how we can modernize them. So can we establish more coffee houses with coffee brewing machines in our institutions of higher, with high concentration of the youth? Institutions with high concentration of the youth so that we can slowly be changing the culture. And to answer the question of um, Debella, that compared to others, coffee is being consumed less. 
why don't we have situations where we don't provide a lot of alternatives? Just the other day, uh, we were discussing with one of the colleagues who is here that we can come up with tuk-tuk coffee clinics. Tuk-tuk coffee clinics in urbanized areas. Such mobile clinic shops may not have alternatives. One of the reasons probably, and I say probably because this is subject to research, one of the reasons why coffee is not being consumed a lot is that is because we go to institutions where there are other alternatives. You go and sit down and uh, a waiter comes and asks you, what can I serve you? And he presents you with a menu. But if we come up with joints, we come up with uh, um, clinics, we come up with, 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 with places of drinking with very little alternatives, then you will realize probably that the coffee consumption may increase because the tea is not around at that point, the uji is not around at that point, any other thing is not around at that point. So can we think of that? Can we also negotiate with high concentration areas with already defined consumers like secondary schools, boarding secondary schools? Can we negotiate with the, uh, the, 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 the heads of, of, of those schools through their associations so that instead of them putting in their evening or morning menus tea, they can put in their morning or evening menus coffee? What stops us from negotiating that with them? Traditionally or historically, you will find that in, in high schools, in universities, what is in the menu is not coffee. Probably it's because we have not stretched out our hands to negotiate with these people. Yet those are high concentration areas of consumption. Now, uh, Oliver also talked about the government providing enabling environment. Yes, that is what they should do largely. Can we also think of tax reduction on coffee consumption to take advantage of a poor's opportunity which he said lies in pricing? I like a uh, related a lot into so many opportunities, but the how to uncover, how to attack those opportunities, ladies and gentlemen, is lacking. So in the pricing, I would approach it that can we find how we can negotiate with our respective governments so that one of the products consumption that is tax relieved or tax reduced is when you buy a cup of coffee. And lastly, Bwana Oliver from the engineering. Coffee brewing machine is fairly bulky and very traditional. Can we look at technology and get a smarter machine to, to brew coffee and also to cap it? When you realize anytime you buy coffee, they struggle to cap it for you, to, 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 to lead it, to put it in a way that you can carry it. Can we come up with some technology that coffee can be brewed and it is already capped for you to walk away with? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, um, you've given us uh, homeworks, but part of what you suggested is also a starting point for, for uh, responses from panelists. I had someone there, and then we go this side. Hello and good morning, all of you. My name is Margaret Mizamo. I'm the president of the Alliance of Women in Coffee and the technical advisor of Mount Kenya West Women in Coffee. So we are a lobby group and we have farmers who are trying to do the value addition. But as part of what has been mentioned by our presenters, there has been very hectic. So I want to go straight to the points that I have. First of all is to thank the panelists. I think this has been one of the most interesting topics that we have learned today. And it has come up with most of the solutions that we are looking for as the women in coffee. But my comment goes to what the government in Kenya, and in particular the coffee directorate, is doing 
in partnering and starting up the coffee shops. I think this is part of the jobs that we need to give to our growers, the farmers. So instead of the coffee directory taking up the jobs, I feel our farmers associations, our societies, they should be empowered so that we can have our coffee being sold at farm gate, not in the universities, because that is where we'll create the employment. And this one I'm delivering from the example of the KTDA. In all the KTDA buying centers, you walk in and you walk out with the, coffee, with the tea. But in the coffee societies, we don't do this. So I would like us to enhance that so that we are able to get the coffee and promote the consumption. Now, the second item is on the perception. I think the engineer has talked about it. The perception that we have on coffee consumption, it is so negative that majority of the people are not able to take coffee. So are we doing enough capacity building so that we can be able to remove part of this perception and also promote on the advantages and the benefits of coffee consumption? The other one has been analyzed by my predecessor. He has talked about incubation, the startup business. Coffee equipments are quite expensive. The Mount Kenya West and the Alliance of Women in Coffee, we are working with youth. We have so many youths, but they try to start up the coffee shops. They are not able because they cannot be able to procure most of these equipment. Uh, then we have the farmers. Our engineer has talked of a farmer who is getting less than a dollar for a kilogram of coffee. But on the other end, we find the consumers or the, the traders, they are getting 18 to 20 dollars. In between, what happens? So we need to expose our producers, we as Africans, so that the producer can be able to understand at what point are we translating the one kilo which is costing one dollar to get it to the 20. And why should we remain at the farm level if we can be able to make the 20? And can we be able to synergize the two so that the farmer can also be able to get closer to the $20? Then we look at the skills involved. I think the engineer has already answered on that. But in Kenya, I think we have a very good opportunity. We have the Micro Small Enterprise Authority, which has been financing most of these skills building capacity. But our government, I don't know whether it has taken up. I see all the other courses have been financed. But the coffee courses, which are being done by most of the youth, the baristas and the rest, are they in that category? So we need to have the government in place, the people who are representing the government here, to lobby for that. Then identification of other finance revenues within the coffee value chain. The Mount Kenya West, which is an affiliate body of the Alliance of Women in Coffee, has taken up a very big program on coffee diversification, and they have brought up the youth who are actually rearing the bees so that they are able to entice them in the coffee business. So I feel because we came into this, into this forum so that we can be able to bring up solutions, some of these things, they need to be upskilled. And if they are upskilled, then we are going to create the many jobs that the engineer has told us. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, we'll get next, there's a lady there. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Nancy. I just wanted to make a few comments. Um, I've been privileged to to interact with various coffee reports over the years. I've also been privileged to travel to different countries. One key one is a very own Ethiopia and uh, been able to see how they drink their coffee. And we all know that uh, at the moment, uh, Ethiopia consumes 50% uh, of their production and their production is not as small as Kenya. So over the years, I've been asking myself, why is it that Kenya, we are not picking up when it comes to consumption? What is it that Ethiopia is doing differently? And uh, I came to the conclusion that though I agree with my predecessors who have said, you know, we should promote coffee shops, and that's what the government has been doing, we should support cooperatives, I am of the opinion that it's 
time we demystify coffee drinking. What do I mean by demystify? If we want Kenyans to drink coffee, for example, let's start at the family level. At home, the way tea is done in Kenya. Our first introduction to tea drinking is home when we are young. Why are we not doing it with coffee? Because we have complicated the process of drinking coffee. First, look at the machinery. How many cooperatives in Kenya are going to afford a roast machine? How many? That is a very expensive machine. And we have been socialized to believe that for us to drink coffee, we need the um, Italian coffee brewing machine. We need, I don't know, Brazilian coffee what? Why can't we make our own simple machinery, which we can even roast coffee using firewood? Because in our rural areas, that is the source of energy, is the firewood, the charcoal. Why can't we fabricate locally affordable that every family will have a simple roasting apparatus made locally where they can roast over firewood? When we are able to come down to that, then we will make our Kenyans drink coffee. We start when they are young. I was sharing with my sister here and I was telling her, I've started in my own home. Every morning there is coffee and there is tea. We don't have to kill the tea. Tea also belongs to Kenya. We are a tea producing country. We, we don't want to kill that. We just want to provide all varieties equally. In our families, we want to have tea. We want to have coffee. We want to have cocoa. Let people start developing their preferences when they are at home, when they are little children. Now, when they go to that school, let the school also provide alternatives and say we are providing coffee, tea, let the child decide whether they are taking coffee or tea. If we do that, when they get to the colleges, they will have defined their own preferences. And having grown in Kericho, which is very well known for tea, I was a tea drinker until I tasted coffee. And we parted, we divorced with tea. It's still in my house, but I don't drink it. I don't desire it because I tasted coffee. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that coffee and tea, they cannot compete. Once you taste coffee, you, you can go back to, to tea. But there are countries who are able to buy our tea. Let's produce for them, but let's drink our coffee. So let us look downwards and say, what are those local technologies fabricated in our local centers? A simple coffee machine, I brought one from Brazil, which they used to use in 1800s. Something made out of a tin where they roll it and roast their coffee over firewood. And then they grind the way we used to grind maize meal on two stones. And you, for a lie, you have your coffee and you brew your coffee very easily and very cheaply. Thank you very much. So, um, thank you very much. Yes, Fred, you're next. Uh, he's up here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Fred Kauma, and uh, I'm a coffee enthusiast. I want to thank the presenters for all the presentations that have been made today. I think these are very informative, very educative. Uh, a lot of my comments have been made, and I just don't want to take time, but I appreciate the uh, Ethiopian experience. And I just wanted to say, if we could pick a lesson from that Ethiopian experience and see how we can adapt you know, to our different uh, situations. Perhaps it could help us. When you go to a, a, a function in Ethiopia and there's somebody who, uh, usually a lady, sits there and they have a small uh, charcoal stove and they roast the coffee there and the, the, the aroma goes around the room. And then they have a small grinder there they grind and boil, boil the coffee and serve everybody. And I have found that that thing really excites people. I thought, uh, Mr. Chairman, we probably need to find a way uh, that we could learn from this Ethiopian experience and see how to encourage people to do it at functions. You know, you know our, we have 
in Africa we have so many functions that take place. Perhaps that would be one of the things that would help us to create awareness and interest in, in this consumption. Uh, and you know, sometimes the coffee is, cons is preserved black, but some people like to drink it with milk or other things. So we, we can have those functions that people, those who want the black coffee can drink the black coffee. Those who want to have the milk, you have also milk, we produce milk here in Africa. You can encourage people, they can drink it in different forms, but encourage them to appreciate the coffee and enjoy it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Fred. This is um, noted, for, at least for comment for panelists. Um, I still have, okay. L let's start here, then the other side, then I'll go over there. Merci, Monsieur le Moderateur. Je suis Fernand Kofi, je suis délégué de la Côte d'Ivoire. Je représente le Conseil du Café Cacao, qui est l'organe de régulation de la filière café et cacao au niveau de la Côte d'Ivoire. Alors, on est tous d'accord que le café est un produit phare et qu'il faut penser à protéger, non seulement à protéger, mais aussi à faire consommer par nos populations pour éviter que nous subissons tout le temps les aléas du marché international. Et en cela, je voulais remercier euh, la présentation de nos panélistes euh, qui ont, nous ont donné une, de très belles présentations. Dire merci au premier responsable du, de l'Éthiopie qui est là. J'ai eu la chance et l'opportunité de visiter et de travailler avec l'Éthiopie sur la consommation. Je dois reconnaître que les habitudes de consommation de l'Éthiopie sont une histoire de tradition, c'est un peu comme les habitudes de consommation du Brésil et en cela euh, il faut leur tirer le chapeau mais ce n'est pas partout pareil au niveau de nos états africains si on est d'accord que le café est une question de goût et d'arôme ce qu'on doit reconnaître c'est que le café la, la politique de consommation future du café doit reposer aussi sur les habitudes de consommation. C'est ça. Can we have another mic, please? On vous apporte un autre micro. Hello. Oui. Je disais que l'autre élément important qu'il faut intégrer dans les politiques de consommation, c'est les habitudes. Pour la plupart de nos états, nous n'avons pas des habitudes de consommation de café. Et ça constitue un gros problème en termes de taux de consommation de ce que nous nous produisons. Ce qu'on essaie de faire, c'est de faire comprendre à nos populations que le café est aussi important que notre euh, chez nous, on parle de gaba, c'est la tchéquée, la semoule de, de manioc que nous mangeons pour résister toute la journée, on essaie de faire comprendre à nos populations que le café est aussi important. Mais en même temps, il faut leur donner le moyen de consommer. Et c'est en cela que je reviens au rôle essentiel de l'État. L'État a un travail important à faire au niveau de nos entrepreneurs. On a beau installer les torréfactions, on a beau installer les artisans de, de torréfaction, la chose, les choses auxquelles on est confronté, c'est comment réduire le coût pour que le produit qu'on présente à nos populations soit abordable. Le niveau de vie, le niveau d'acceptabilité du produit qui est présenté. On a pour la plupart de nos États l'installation même des torréfacteurs qui constitue un gros problème en termes de cherté des coûts de, du matériel entrant. Donc, si pour la plupart du temps nos États peuvent faire des franchises sur les installations, il faut qu'ils pensent aussi à faire des franchises sur les coûts des matériaux que nous utilisons pour la transformation du café et même parfois 
régler le problème de l'approvisionnement du café au niveau de nos jeunes artisans torréfacteurs. Parce que, je le dis parce que chez nous le problème se pose, on n'a pas une réglementation claire qui est liée à cette activité et donc on a tendance à les confondre aux grands groupes étrangers à qui on a donné des j'allais dire des, des droits d'installation et qui sont des véritables concurrents de, des, des artisans locaux. Donc il faut pouvoir trancher ces questions, mais en même temps, il faut penser aussi à créer des générations de consommateurs. Si on est d'accord que le, le, la, la, la réussite de la bataille de demain sur la consommation, c'est les générations futures. Il faut les amener à comprendre que le café doit faire partie de leur quotidien. Alors, je suis tenté de dire et de demander à l'OIAC d'insister sur l'initiative qu'ils viennent de prendre, à savoir permettre que le café soit une matière de base au niveau de nos différents états de l'Union africaine, mais en même temps, ils doivent insister auprès de ces chefs d'État pour qu'ils facilitent l'activité de promotion de la consommation interne. C'est vrai, il y a des initiatives privées, mais tant que l'État ne soutient pas ces initiatives privées, qui sont des initiatives locales, on ne pourra pas faire face aux grands groupes étrangers parce que, je vous donne l'exemple de chez nous, les artisans euh, les facteurs ont du mal à faire insérer les produits dans les grandes surfaces de commercialisation. Simplement parce que les grands groupes qui y sont n'ont pas envie de voir les produits de, de, des torréfacteurs dans leur rayon. Mais à contrario, comme un panéliste le disait tout à l'heure, on produit 90%, on en consomme très peu, on exporte beaucoup. Le même café part en Occident, ça revient dans notre surface et ça coûte deux fois plus cher. Alors qu'on pouvait simplement régler le problème au niveau local. Donc c'est pour ça que j'insiste au niveau de l'OIAC pour que cette initiative aille au-delà de la simple introduction du café comme matière de base. Il faut aller au-delà, il faut pousser nos chefs d'État, surtout nos 25 chefs d'État, à comprendre que le café, c'est nous-mêmes. Si on veut être bien demain, il faut qu'on accepte nous-mêmes notre produit et qu'on trouve le moyen de consommer. Comme le fait l'Éthiopie, si chaque pays arrive à consommer 50%, c'est les Occidentaux qui vont venir nous réclamer notre café. Et c'est de ça qu'il s'agit. C'est sur ça que je voulais m'arrêter et dire merci à tout le monde. Merci pour l'intervention. Je crois que je vais donner la parole après à M. le secrétaire général de l'OIAC pour en faire un commentaire. Merci. Je suis James Minai de Coffee Research Institute. I agree that the issue of domestic consumption is pertinent and I can't agree more with, the, with Nancy on having the local apparatus for preparing coffee in the homes. But I find a paradox, especially in Kenya, because when I interact with my colleagues from, coffee, uh, from Tea Research Institute, they still have a similar issue. And they say that we consume less than 5% of the tea that we produce. And I want to submit and say that uh, perhaps substituting um, uh, tea for coffee may not have much in terms of impact in the nation. And that is something perhaps as we talk about uh, domestic coffee consumption that we need to look at. Perhaps the issue that might be more pertinent to, um, to, to address may be that issue of importing coffee that is you know, processed, whereby we, we export our coffee and then we, we import Uh, coffee that is further processed. Otherwise, the aspect of uh, domestic consumption in terms of percentages, you find, you know, uh, tea, tea people still say the same thing, that we are, pro we are consuming less than 5% of what we produce. In coffee, we are also consuming less than 5% of what we produce. So substituting one for another perhaps may not be a solution. 
So maybe as we address this matter, and perhaps Dr. Apoyo is something that to look at, uh, look at what is it that we are importing in terms of processed coffees vis-a-vis -vis what if we went what the way Nancy was, uh, was uh, uh, proposing so that even in our hotels we have our coffee consumed rather than what is imported. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's noted. So uh, let's make sure that we use our time more efficiently. How many questions do we have? One, two. You have a question? Yes, yes. Um, let me first get the set of questions. Yes, please. Um, the lady there and then on the other side. Hello, my name is uh, Esther Ocheno, a Kenyan running a barista school here in uh, Nairobi. And uh, I just strongly feel that uh, coffee education is connected to increasing coffee consumption. And I'm talking from experience. And I just started with my uh, family and friends. I asked them, okay, um, why are you not drinking coffee? And the first uh, answer is, number one, I don't know anything about coffee. These are Kenyans. I don't know anything about coffee, number one. Number two, I don't even know how to brew it. I don't know how to use these machines. It's like rock and science to me. No one has taught us how to use these machines. Number three, I don't know how to appreciate the taste of coffee. Yeah? And I also don't have knowledge of coffee. Like when I go to the supermarket, I see the same packet written dark roast, light roast, medium roast. What is that about? Yeah? So we cannot uh, um, increase coffee consumption without giving people basic coffee education. Because people have to understand what is coffee? What is the difference between this roast, that roast? How do I taste coffee? How do I appreciate uh, the taste of coffee? How do I know a good uh, tasting coffee from a bad uh, tasting coffee? Then how do I also use these machines yeah, to brew coffee at home and even in the, in the commercial coffee shops? And that is uh, exactly why I started Barista Pro, which is a, a coffee brewing school. And for those of us who don't know who a barista is here, a barista is a coffee brewing expert. People need to be taught how to brew coffee well so that the consumers can appreciate it. Yeah? Because so you can Thank give... you very much. The point is taken. Yeah. So coffee education. Yeah, coffee education. So to increase coffee. Yeah. Yes. Let's use our time. Yes, please. The last two questions. Yeah, um, good afternoon again. I'm um, Dr. James Vebe, um, Executive Chairman, Produce Monetary Board, Sierra Leone. Um, mine is a very short one. Um, we in Sierra Leone try to do some review in our strategy to increase um, domestic consumption of coffee in Sierra Leone. We really have a very long experience with coffee business in Sierra Leone since 1890. But we found out that we have plotted strategies in the university, create um, coffee bases in communities, but there was still some resistance in coffee consumption. But um, during our review, we find out that we have not been able to attract it, especially uh, our strategy is not capturing their minds. We are in a computer age where youth actually want to have things that have direct effect on them. We find out that we have an electrical engineer, a young lady of 22, who is doing a coffee a value addition called Diana. And Diana's strategy to enter into the society is that her coffee has um, a peculiarity of giving energy to the young people. So we find out that Diana's coffee um, it's one of the most important Within a space of one year, she has captured a lot of coffee drinkers. So we decided to know why. The reason for that is 
um, youth of our days actually want to take things that has direct effect on them. So that is the reason why Diana's coffee is actually selling very high. And then we also exploited that um, even with our coffee base um, strategy, we, we are not able to enter into the society as we expected. But we have decided now as a national policy to be sending young people for coffee conferences um, that will encourage them to see coffee as not just a thing of the old. If you look into this house, I don't think if there's any youth, really, as we have gathered here. So what we are doing now, we are discussing strategies of 40, 30 years ago. Um, in fact, I shouldn't have been here if it was not um, uh, a kind of declaration signing. Um, I was going to send a very young lady to have come and represent because that is what we have decided that whenever there are conferences of coffee in the globe, we send our young to come and have practical experience and they will be able to filter it properly within our society. Thank you. Thank you very much. So most of those are just comments. Yes, please. Thank you, moderator, uh, and the former speakers. I'm, I'm Mary Maina. I'm a farmer and uh, a coffee champion. And uh, I want to, to comment on uh, the issue of domestic consumption. Uh, the issue, we have to deal with the demystifying of the coffee con consumption from a scientific uh, front where uh, people with the know-how, people in authority can be able to demystify the issue of coffee, uh, coffee drinking. Because I have done a lot of mobilizing uh, down to the farmers, down to the uh, ground there, and one of the things that the people have an issue with is uh, there are so many myths about coffee taking. Some say uh, they get sick, they will have dizziness, they will have ulcers, they will get sick, high blood pressure, uh, the heart palpates, but that is all informed out of ignorance because of the stories that they hear that coffee has certain effects. So when you go there, uh, you are telling people about the need of coffee taking, you find they are inhibited by those briefs, by those myths, that the coffee uh, has negative effects. And the only way we can counter it is when it is tackled as the top, at the top, where government officials, where those in authority can take up the issue of um, demobilizing the people of those ideas, of uh, where they, they will create awareness through the media and through any other forums. And when people now hear people in authority uh, are talking about uh, the need of taking coffee and also the benefits of taking coffee, it makes it easy. The other thing you find, the other beverages in the market, let's say even like tea and uh, the others, you'll find they have written, they write the benefits of those beverages, of those products. They will say what, uh, what good are in them. So somebody will say, if I take this, it will help me in this way and th that way. It helps in diabetes, it helps in uh, lowering uh, blood pressure, it helps in this and the other way. So uh, the, the, the myths that were there, and they were from a very long time ago. That's why even in the families, as we are saying, we have gone to even to teach people how to brew coffee at the family level, and we are saying the woman is very important because she's the one that cooks, and she determines the, 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 the menu. 
But if herself she's in, inhibited by the belief that coffee is injurious, coffee is, is not good, she cannot give it to her, her, her family. And then, hence, coffee consumption is inhibited. The other thing is the, the, the scientific bodies, even like CARO, CRF, and the, the other uh, scientific bodies in other nations, if they can take up to demobilize those beliefs and uh, demystify the, the negativity in the coffee, then I think we will start now penetrating in the coffee consumption. And looking as to why I have gone to schools to talk to the head teachers on how they can, uh, we can introduce coffee to the schools. But they are very afraid, they are also ignorant, they don't know. They believe when the students are given coffee, it, it will affect them. And I think this is where um, people, uh, awareness needs to be created. When it comes from the scientific uh, point, even the, the teachers, even the readers and various people will get it because people go by what they hear. They hear this thing is good, they will take it as good. If they hear it is bad, they will take it as bad. So I think one of the issues that we should take is to see how you can take, uh, the issue that you can take to tackle that uh, issue of negativity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we, we, we could feel... We could feel the passion in the room around domestic uh, coffee consumption. And most of the comments made were contributions to the presentations we've had from our three eminent panelists. Uh, I will give them, um, we, we don't take any other question, sorry. Uh, just a quick one. If it's something new that hasn't been discussed, Okay, thank you for giving me a moment. My name is Irene, uh, a CEO of one of our unions in the country, Kenya, uh, specifically Muranga Farmers Union. And I'm loving the conversations. They should have been here like yesterday. But what uh, I'm still stuck at the paradox, Dr. Aboyo's initial presentation, on the payment and the returns to the farmer vis-a-vis -vis the high cost of the cup. At the, at the southern hemisphere. And I'm stuck there, why? Because uh, at the union level, we, we, take, uh, we are secondary, we are aggregates of societies, cooperative societies who take care of the farmer's coffee, right from the processing, production, uh, production processing, and uh, a bit of that uh, uh, crop husbandry perspective. And the question is, Let's get stuck there. Let's interrogate this myth. What, what is this, what's the secret between the cost of the coffee repayment to the farmer and the cost of putting the coffee to the cup? Probably, yes, the coffee machinery and everything in between can be an answer. But for me, somebody the other day in a, in a meeting I was said, there's a myth around coffee. And the myth is, the, the, the crop production processing is okay. It can be done by the farmer. But there's a point where it reaches and it becomes, hmm, this is a little complicated now. The farmer does not understand this aspect. Now it must be taken up by someone else. And I think that's where we lose the link between that payment to the farmer who has struggled so much in the production level and at this point of now, processing, marketing, and that, and that, all, all that concept. Let's not lose that uh, perspective. Thank, and thank I know a bit much. of it has been given by Oliver. Sure. Let me finish. Oliver brought it very well in terms of increasement of low, uh, domestic uh, marketing, where we can consume it so much at the domestic level. Until when people come and ask for it, we say, we don't have. We've consumed all of it around. And, and again, maybe the farmer at that point, maybe the price will be Thank you very better. Much. Yeah. We've, Thank you. We've Thank got you the very point. much. Yeah. Um, to, to be fair, let's go with the last question or comment. Yes, please. Go ahead. Well, uh, my name is Willie Chiragon from representing Baringo farmers. Uh, first of all, I would like to 
give uh, appreciation to uh, Ayako for hosting the first summit, coffee summit in Kenya. My first appreciation to you and the panelists. Uh, secondly, uh, with this uh, drive of domestic consumption, because we are here as the G25, I, I think we are on the right track. We are on the right track, and I, would, I wanted to just say uh, one issue. Uh, I have learned something which, uh, which I'm wondering. Uh, for example, in Kenya, if we take the ma mature, the youth and the old men and maybe the older, we take about 8 million Kenyans, only taking two cups of coffee per day. And then later on, you take tea in the evening. So it's okay. I was calculating what uh, Ndekpa was saying, and I am shocked. Because they are the crown, the way Madame has said, the farmer actually has lost the network. Because, say for example, that 8 million Kenyans times uh, two cups a day of 10 grams, that is a cup is five grams, five grams. Yeah? You get 16 million cups. And these cups is sold a cup of cappuccino, for example, is sold for two dollars. You get that two million dollars just in a day for only two cups. But we have not taken more than two cups. I'm just limiting to two cups. So I was doing calculation. Imagine what we could be achieving now as Kenya, for example, one of the G25 in the coffee sector now at the farmer, uh, you calculate that 32 million dollars to Kenya shillings comes to... So thank you very much. Yeah, we, so, we, so we it is, uh, I'm stage. seeing the direction. Yes. Now the farmer, what Madam was saying is, this amount, if we can really uh, promote the consumption, yeah, will be much better. Whatever will remain, we'll export, but now, we need now Iafka, I, I, what is Iafka, the question? Please, please, to do... Go straight to, what is the question? Yeah, we do sensitization because now we are all here. We have direction right, of work. so thank you very much. So South. as I said earlier, um, there is a passion about um, how we can improve or inc increase local consumption in our countries, uh, starting with the G25. Uh, we've had comment on culture, education, practices, so those are comments to what we've discussed in the morning. Uh, as we wrap up, um, I want to give a minute to our panelists um, um, to just pick a few questions. Uh, you know, um, the, if we could, uh, from delegates from Ethiopia and, and Kenya, if we could talk more about taking advantage of intra-African trade, and how, what do we do now? Because the current status, we know it. I, I'll give you, I'll give you an opportunity. Sorry? I have a meeting, I have a meeting. I wanted to answer. All right, should I start with you? Yes, please. All right, so, so um, uh, since the yes. SG is leaving, um, yes. I want to give him an opportunity to respond to the yeah, comments so, that were made by the representative from, yeah, sorry, sorry, from Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, chairman, I have to rush for a meeting, but I wanted to answer the questions that have been raised by the uh, participants. I want to thank all of you for the uh, very good presentations and uh, especially the uh, new startup company, Mr. Ndegwa, thank you for your interesting presentation. But I'll answer the question raised by Professor Jirongo, who I've been privileged to work with for the last eight months. We opened a coffee house in, uh, at the Kenyatta University and it's doing very well. I visited it a couple of days ago. They want more to open more coffee houses at the university. So. It seems that uh, project is working well. And also I had the opportunity and privilege to visit uh, uh, Mr. Ndegwa's uh, cafe. So I totally understand where the direction is in terms of the support for domestic consumption. Ayako is committed and I wanted to just share the initiatives that we have started uh, in the last couple of months. We have opened up uh, an inter-Africa training 
uh, Institute to train brewers, roasters, and cuppers. And I'm very privileged to uh, uh, introduce our partner who has flown all the way from Abidjan, Mr. Hadi. I think you can stand up. We've partnered with uh, Mr. Hadi's company. It's called Continental Cafe to open up a training uh, barrister school for young uh, Africans within the region. And uh, this is uh, part of uh, the issue I think one of the ladies raised, that we need to educate the youth, we need to train the youth. So we've already started that journey. And uh, the Inter-Africa Training Institute, I think, will start uh, training next month. So that's one initiative for the youth. The second initiative is the Africa Youth Barrister Championship, which will be held in uh, Togo in November. So this is also another initiative to assist the youth in uh, building capacity for domestic consumption. Uh, we have also started an Africa Youth in Coffee Forum, which is also aimed at helping the young people to learn how to drink coffee and roast it. We've also set up an Africa Women in Coffee Forum. Uh, we're working with the International Coffee Alliance for Women to see how we can help women in, uh, across the value chain. Uh, now, the declaration we signed yesterday is just a first step. Once we're under the AU framework, we'll be able to uh, tap on some of the other projects under the Africa Development Bank and Africa Exim Bank. So uh, back to that question on the role of what government is doing. I think these are some initiatives that we're doing to answer that question raised by the professor. His other professor, uh, question was, what are we doing with the data that we collect? How can we use the data that we're collecting? Uh, the data, and this is very important, we have uh, set up a partnership with the, Af the entire region so we can collect statistics to be able to help us to formulate better policies at the regional level and also to come up with good poly um, uh, strategies for promotion. So data is very important. We've uh, asked our Director of Economic Affairs, I think, uh, Ms. Dr. Bema Kulibali, to collect contact uh, uh, lists of all African representatives who are here. So the data is going to be used to help you to come up with projects and other support. Um, finally, I think on the issue of uh, uh, the political buy-in, yes, I think raised by the gentleman here, we are also working again under the African Union framework. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to share that information. Thank you. That was useful. Thank you very much, um, Secretary General of IACO. So I'll be I request to leave, sir. Sorry? I request for permission to leave. Yes, please. Thank you. Go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. So I'll be giving a minute to our panelists to conclude and respond um, to some of the discussions we've had. But there was one comment um, that, was, that struck my mind, um, especially because I'm sitting with regulators from both Kenya and, 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 and Ethiopia. How can you ensure eco-sharing of returns? of opportunities within the value chains. So that because most of the time we talk about private sector, we don't go back and see how the farmer will get the benefit. If we are to add more values to our products, if we are to add more you know, uh, value to coffee, is the same amount um, proportionately, or, or is it the amount that goes to the farmer, is it proportionate to what uh, other players within the segment of value chains are getting? So over to you. I'll start with Dr. Um, Adugna. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I can see that the participants are all passionate to really use our resources. And I was very much thrilled by the speech that was made by His Excellency, the President Toro Kenyatta, how much he's passionate for the coffee, supporting the farmers is something that strikes my mind. So uh, this would help Kenya to really boost uh, on uh, this co coffee do domestic consumption and they can use this opportunity to really uh, uh, tap the uh, resources and support the farmers. Uh, to the specific question that uh, has been asked is that we've already started to uh, add value on the coffees. It's not only selling the raw coffee at the lower prices, we're also starting to add coffee values on coffee like roasting and grinding and also packing. So for that, we've developed the, answer, the request uh, or the question that was raised by the lady there. We have already opened up a school 
for uh, barista, for roasting, and for brewing, and something like that. So this would help us to really use uh, or add value and increase the local consumptions that we are actually uh, looking for. So the school that we have opened is uh, the, the first of its kind in East, in East Africa, and we also invite all the coffee-growing countries here in, in Africa to really use this resource which, which are the state of the arts uh, equipments have been installed there. And we have uh, different uh, professionals starting from the Ili coffee in Italy and uh, uh, professionals from Germany and also elsewhere in the world. So this can be a shared uh, vision and a shared resource that we can tap on in order to just increase this uh, coffee consumption in our country. So, uh, Professor from University of Kenyatta, this is really something that you should also take as an assignment because you have a very passionate president that would actually help you to further include in or inculcate in your curriculum and support students to really uh, use the coffee. So, uh, these are some of the points I would like to address. And uh, very good point that I picked up is that Nancy, she said, let's start from the family. That was the point to really uh, increase the coffee, uh, domestic coffee consumption in, in, the, in Africa. So if we start from the family, it will be expand to the, the community level and then to the country level. So let's use this opportunity and mo let's make this as a motto to uh, further promote coffee, dom domestic coffee consumption in our uh, continent. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Dugna. Indeed, we should start in our homes, in our families, but Mary said, we should start with our mothers, sisters, and wives. Uh, Dr. Benson. Okay, thank you, Chair, and the audience and the persons that we have fielded. Of course, we have taken your comments. Uh, we may not necessarily have the answers, but it is a learning experience for us that we are going to take up. But allow me to respond to some of the specific questions that I think we may have some answers right now. One of the things is that uh, <clears throat> I talked about the paradox of the coffee. And uh, if you look at uh, the presentations, uh, there's always a problem where people say that coffee, when you do the farming, you don't get the value. But the people who sell the coffee in the shops, they do have the value, they get the value. So the one of the paradoxes is what prevents us from starting coffee houses? If the value of coffee is in the soap or is in the cup, there's no legislation in this country that bars farmers from setting up a coffee soap within their locality. We have licensed quite a number of coffee value or coffee cooperative societies to do value addition in their localities and sell to the neighborhood, and it is taking root. So two things I want us to, uh, to differentiate. There is material value of coffee that is the same price that the value of that coffee that you might go in the shop and buy, may say, $10, let's say for 20 or for 250 gram, $10. That is the value of that particular coffee. But there's that material value of coffee which might be sold even $20, or a cup can be sold $5. What is it that the owner has done to add that value? It is not maybe the only, it, is made of, it may not be the quality of that coffee, of the content of that coffee, but there are some aspects of value addition that, that has been done. So until now, we know what can we do better in our area of civilization as had been captured by my colleague from Ethiopia, comparative advantage. Let us take advantage of the comparative advantage so that there's money at the immaterial value of coffee rather than the value, the material value. What I mean is that when you do value addition, when you employ people, when you start a coffee house, the value of coffee is going to be enhanced. And that is what we have empowered our farmers and our uh, <coughs> stakeholders to do. Then to the, to the, to the issue of Ms. Uh, Dr. Jagongo, 
what do we do with the data? The data we get help us to make planning and help us to forecast ahead and see where we can lack or we are lacking so that we can be able to enhance and uh, pull up our socks. Like for example, most of us have seen today that Kenya imports a lot of coffee from Africa, whereas the export amount we do to the market destination in Africa is quite negligible. That is an indication that we consume coffee. Coffee consumption has taken root in Kenya. And therefore, the even coffee houses, they tell us they don't need only to consume Kenyan coffee, that they would like to even import coffee from the rest of the, the country, of the, of the continent. So I think that has helped us to plan, and uh, it is an area that we still have much more to do. Lastly, on the issue of uh, the youth. Yes, a youth are only a vehicle that we use to, to leverage on this area. I do agree that we did not invite much and uh, quite a number of the youth to this forum. Uh, it is an area that uh, probably uh, we are going to pull up our socks because we have been working with the youth quite, quite a number. But when it comes to such forum where they can be able to understand and follow the the discussion, the youth are uh, limited. So I think that is an area, and uh, we are going to improve on that, and we are taking this as a country. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Benson. Uh, now back to Mr. Oli. You, you've heard the discussions, and most of them um, are requesting the government to provide a conducive environment to incentivize you know, uh, coffee consumption enterprises. What is your take message from these discussions and what is the role of private sector into this? Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Now, um, I'll start from where Nancy left. We say that uh, charity begins at home. Coffee, like any other beverage, is a palate you have to develop. And for it to be palatable to you, you have to start by taking the first cup which means if you wake up and smell it and then you take it, it means when you go out, you will have that craving to take the next cup. So if starting from home and coming to work at the office, you will develop that interest, which over time becomes a habit, over time it becomes a culture, and then we will not need to have this discussion of we are not consuming that which we produce, and therefore people hold that a transom for it. Number two, I think uh, from where I sit, the government, yes, has its role to play in enabling what must happen in the private sector so that it can be done. But I think also, it is also our own initiative. You must be very intentional about taking coffee past roasting as a business and actually introducing it to our schools as a means to an end such that we have people graduating from schools and they know that they are in school of business and they are going out to start a business in coffee and they actually can earn a living out of it. When we're intentional about that, we know for sure that it's something that we start as a conversation early in life and we actually take it up and be able to tap into that second most traded product on earth. How can it not be useful to us, yet the people who are producing oil are rich companies rich countries, and some of those countries are actually in Africa, and they actually do get direct benefit from that product. So if this is the second one, it's not even gold. Gold does not even come close to coffee. I mean, really, the conversation should actually take up from here is we need to go and challenge ourselves and create opportunities and get our own to start working. There is sources of income everywhere in terms of who can fund our organizations, no small startups of coffee shops. They can be funded with banks, with family, um, uh, family savings. You know, people who are employment, in employment, they can actually start that as a small fund, and it doesn't have to be very expensive. I mean, you can start with a simple filter, which costs about $40, and at a corner, you start just brewing coffee and serving in a cup, right? And that becomes your first point of contact. In two, three months, you can afford all the big machines, because sometimes you get the big machines for for commercial purposes, because if you're serving many, then you may not be able to grind with your hand. So to me, let it be a conversation that we start. We need to be intentional about it. We need to sell the idea to our younger people so that they know they don't have to sit at home. They can just get a small in, 
you know, investment which families can raise and they can get to it. And finally, the business knowledge needs to be intentional as well. You know, in our business schools, when we go to school, we learn about the business. And I think knowing that you can inst instill the same skills to go and actually convert and have profitability out of a product. And practically, you can see what is happening like in this country. We have over 70% of our cafes are owned by foreigners. All that money, we are the ones spending the money, and it's going abroad. What if we did the initiatives ourselves and retain the money here? It means we would pay the farmer better and pay ourselves better. And that would be my submission, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is the end of our panel discussions. And please, ladies and gentlemen, join me in thanking our uh, panelists. Back to you. Thank you very time. much, uh, panelists. That was a good uh, uh, presentation, and uh, it's fair just on, the, on that uh, discussion. So I, I wish to make a few announcements. Uh, so I think you are, we release you now. We thank you. I'm proud of them once more. Thank you. Thank you. So I wish to make a few announcements. Now lunch will be served at the same place where we had it yesterday. And now it's going to 2 o'clock, so we need one hour. So we, we'll come back here maybe at 2.45. I think for, for five minutes are enough because the afternoon is going to get even more brief if we prolong lunch. So do we agree on 2.45 or 3 p.m.? I think we can agree on 2.45. Secondly, there will be dinner. There will be Gara dinner today. The Gara dinner is sponsored by the Cooperative Bank of Kenya, and it will be in the same venue where we are going to have our lunch. Number three is that we have virtual presentations in the next panel from 2.45. So there are some presenters who may not come physically, but we have made plans to have virtual presentations and the Q and the A will be also will be, will be able to take place the Q and the A. And finally, we have COVID testing sessions between five and six today. So after five today, delegates will move to where we have the booths. There will be a setup for testing sessions. So we invite you to sample and test our coffee from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. today. Finally, we have some Boots outside here, some exhibitions. We have the Agriculture and the Food Authority Coffee Directorate. We wish that you get information on how to access Kenya coffee and uh, other statistics about the coffee we produce in Kenya. We have some coffee houses there, like Dormans. Please pass there and uh, sample our Kenya coffee, which is on offer. So, with those remarks, I wish to have this session adjourned for the next 45 minutes for lunch. So enjoy your lunch. Bon appétit. Thank you. We need to play for lunch, so give the delegate standing the microphone to play for lunch. Thank you. Thank you very much. We all stand up for prayer. We all stand up for prayer. And let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this afternoon. Thank you for your greater hand, which has taken us through from our various areas up to yesterday's, up to today. We are now humble before you, Lord. As we go for our lunch, please bless our lunch, plus drinks and cleanse before we take it, so that it can be a blessing in our bodies until we come back again and we meet and we shall appreciate your name. In Jesus' name, we pray and believe. Amen.
Hello? Hello? Dr. Maria? Dr. Maria? Hello, Dr. Maria?
즉, 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 즉. 즉즉즉 마이크 체크 즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉즉
Mic check one two. One two mic check. Mic check one two. One two mic check. Mic check, mic check, mic check one two. One two mic check. Mic check one. Thanks, Dr. Marie and uh, Mr. John for staying. Uh, we would like now to uh, do a test for the screen sharing so that we can be clear whether you're sharing the screens from that side. Uh, maybe... Um, you mute. Uh, we can start off with uh, Mr. J uh, Mr. John. Maybe you can go on and share your screen from your end, kindly. Okay. No problem. Can you see my screen now? All right. Uh, yeah, perfect. Um, what do I Excellent. I will stop sharing. Uh, oh. Well, go ahead and share mine. Uh, Dr. Maria, kindly. You can go on and share the screen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, please, uh, uh, thank you, thank you, yeah. Uh, we are now able to get you clear and uh, so now you just hang on there we wait for the delegates to come back from the break so that uh, we can proceed with the the program okay no problem yeah, yeah from So from the program, um, Mr. John will go first, and uh, immediately after you're done doing your presentation, then we'll have uh, Dr. Maria. And uh, well, the moderator will uh, be able to say whether they are able to take questions in between or after the two presentations, or uh, I mean, the time you'll get to engage the delegates. Okay.
kuongea lakini ah yeah. kuongea tu ni yeah. kuo, ni unakuja kaanza si Kisha... inakuwa ni iko off
Now, we want to start the afternoon session. We wish to start the afternoon session. So those who are outside, should you come in, we start. The afternoon session will start in the next five minutes, please. Members, get seated, get ready. We are starting the afternoon session because we have other activities after five. I now invite the moderator of the afternoon session to take the stage. Anapel Bifane. The moderator for the afternoon session, please, you can take the, the stage. Annabel be fun if you are in the, in the room. Now, the presenters, <clears throat> we have some panelists who are, who are going to do their presentations virtually, and unless we keep time, we might not benefit from those two presenters. The presenters are already waiting, they have been connected, and they are to make virtual presentations. There are two. We have uh, Dr. Maria from Panama, and we have uh, Juan Luis Barrios from uh, the US. Those two panelists will make virtual presentations, and they have been already connected virtually. So unless we keep our time, they may they might find it difficult to hang on there until we start. We, we are better off getting their presentations if we start now. So we are lacking the, the moderator of the session, who is uh, Anna Peris Bifane, who is the director of coffee and cocoa. So let's give the, the moderator a few minutes, then we start.
Ini. Those who are outside can come in. those who are outside. Now, the moderator for the next panel is in the room, but she speaks French and I speak English, so there was lack of communication between us. It has been resolved. The problem has been resolved and she's coming on the stage. Apologies for that uh, mishap. Now, I invite uh, the members coming in, please take your seats and we can start. Now, members, I'm waiting for some members who have come in to settle down, then we can start. I also invite uh, one of the panelists, uh, Mr. Rupen Gesorda, to. We need a technician from behind there to assist the moderator here with some technical issues. So we have the, one of the panelists in the room, Mr. Rupen Nigasore, please come forward. Oh, thank you, thank you for... Now we have two... Uh, we have uh, Dr. Rechina Mwangi from Death and Kimati University. Please join the, the panel. Hello. Hello.
coffee standards. The topic for the afternoon is value addition and African coffee standards. And I introduce the deputy director of coffee, coffee and cocoa uh, cooperation. Now, uh, Anaper Bifane is an agriculture engineer by training. She's the deputy director in charge of. Now, I will give her the stage <clears throat> to carry on from there. Bonsoir. Tous uh, les panelists sont présents. Merci de m'avoir donné la parole. Euh, ce soir, euh, cet après-midi, nous sommes réunis pour euh, suivre euh, les euh, présentations de, des panélistes qui vont nous entretenir euh, sur euh, la valeur ajoutée et les normes africaines de café. C'est bon Voilà, les normes africaines de café. Alors, euh, euh, les, nous, a, nous aurons une, les listes vont faire des présentations pendant deux heures, donc de 15h30 à 17h30. Et pendant 30 minutes, nous aurons euh, une plénière, donc euh, la période de questions-réponses. Alors, euh, euh, nous, justement, comme je disais, nous allons parler aujourd'hui de la valeur ajoutée et des normes africaines. Euh, sujet très, très important pour nous, euh, producteurs euh, de café, producteurs africains de café. Parce que nous savons qu'aujourd'hui, les États, certains États, encouragent la transformation locale, donc la valeur ajoutée du café. Et l'OIC et l'OIAC également encouragent ces États membres à transformer le café localement pour ajouter de la valeur à ces produits. Et les normes et la valeur ajoutée vont de pair parce que. Euh, la norme qui est une ligne directrice de la production euh, va permettre justement à ces États membres, à ces États producteurs de café, de, de produire un café de bonne qualité, un café durable de bonne qualité en suivant les directives de, 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 des normes justement qui sont mises en place pour cela. Alors, euh, la valeur ajoutée est... Euh, les normes africaines sont le, le sujet de ce jour. Les normes africaines sont d'autant plus euh, importantes parce que euh, cela, permet, euh, de, cela permet une harmonisation de la production euh, de café euh, sur, le, sur le plan régional. Euh, parce qu'aujourd'hui, on parle de la ZLECAF, donc euh, mettre en place des normes euh, africaines euh, qui tiennent compte euh, de, du développement durable, des objectifs du, dévo du développement durable, qui tiennent compte de nos réalités, hein, de nos réalités africaines. Euh, C'est une force, ça peut être une force aujourd'hui euh, pour euh, l'amélioration de la valeur ajoutée, pour la commercialisation de notre café et euh, pour euh, améliorer euh, une bonne circulation justement de, de nos produits, euh, euh, de, 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 de notre café. Donc, pour, ce, pour ce, ce débat, je vais d'abord euh, euh, donner la parole à M. Monsieur, monsieur Juan Lui. Euh, M. Juan Lui, qui est... Ah non. Donc, on va commencer par les présentations en présentiel, alors, parce que les deux qui ont des présentations virtuelles, apparemment, ce n'est pas encore prêt. Donc, je vais commencer par M. Ruben. C'est vous, voilà. Alors, M. Ruben euh, Chisore, qui a un master en études du développement de l'Université Homo Kenyatta pour l'agriculture et la technologie. Il prépare en ce moment un doctorat en études du développement. Il a une très longue expérience dans les questions de stratégie en matière de normalisation et d'évaluation de la conformité. Il est actuellement directeur technique de l'Organisation africaine de normalisation ARSO. Monsieur Ruben, vous avez la parole. Thank you, uh, Madame Moderator. So I don't know whether the presentation is available so that I can start off with it very fast. 
uh, visually. Is it available? Now, um, in, the mo in the morning session, we had uh, very nice uh, discussions. Uh, and one of the aspects that we will need to address, and I think I'm not going to repeat it quite a lot, is the fact that uh, consumption needs to be encouraged in the continent. Now, uh, uh, among the reasons, of course, that uh, consumption is not very good is uh, the idea that perhaps even the quality of the product itself is not known. So, uh, Madam Moderator, I don't know whether the presentation will be there or I, I will talk from at this end without any presentation so that Um, Any clarification about the PowerPoint pre presentation? Bon, si la présentation n'est pas prête, si la présentation n'est pas prête, nous allons, dans ce cas, donner la parole à Madame Regina Mwangi. Voilà. Donc, euh, Madame Regina Mwangi, pour sa contribution à la valeur ajoutée du café. Elle boit café et parle café. <laughs> Alors, Madame Mwangi, la parole est à vous. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, that's a problem of a teacher. The teacher always needs a response. Uh, I'm here to talk about value addition of coffee in Kenya, and we'll go straight to the PowerPoint so that we can start off. I can't get the pointer, please. It was in. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start with the, the definition of coffee value addition, which is the difference between the price of the product and the cost of producing it. This is according to Porter, and you'll allow me because I'm an academician, I have to keep on quoting because it's allowed. Uh, this Porter defined that as the price or the difference between the price of the final product and the cost of producing it. This means that when a product is in its original form and the value is not added to it, it will be the same product. So in this, it means that from the, uh, where the product was conceived, for example, in coffee, we have the coffee from the seed. And we talk of the coffee value chain from the seed to the cup. So from the seed to the cup, it means that there are steps, different steps or different processes that are there so that it can change the features of a product or the components of a product from one stage to another. And this is what we are saying that these stages must follow and must follow in the right order. This is what we call the efficiency and effectiveness, whereby you do the right thing, and not only doing the right thing, but you do it right. So uh, there are different stages in the coffee value chain, and in the continuum of the coffee value chain, we have different stages that coffee undergoes from the seed all the way to the cup. So the price of the product increases as it progresses 
from one stage or from one step to another. And this coffee value addition, this is where now the manufacturers take the product, they increase or they change the features of a product, they change the components of a product, and then they have a new product. So to the final product, this is where we have the price of the coffee. And from the previous speakers, we have seen that the price of a finished product is very high compared to the price of a product that value has not been added to it. So the coffee value addition starts right from the seed to the cup. But at this moment, I'm just going to discuss the value addition at the higher end of the coffee value chain, which start from secondary processing. That is the roasting, the breading, the roasting, the packaging, the roasting, the grinding, the packaging, and then you distribute that coffee to the consumers, what we call the marketing. Let's see the way the value addition is done in Kenya. I have said I will start from the secondary processing, but here I have started from the primary processing because most of us are used to seeing the coffee sherry. From the coffee sherry, we add value to either to the parchment because there is a process that is undertaken for it to change the features of that coffee. So from the coffee sherry, it goes through a stage we call the primary processing. That is one of the stage that is pulping, and then you get to parchment coffee. This is what we refer to as wet processing. And if you don't do the wet processing, there is dry processing, and you get what we call buni. Most of the time, buni is what is sorted from the clean coffee. So from there, the buni and the parchment, they are taken for hiring in a milling uh, organization, and you get the raw green coffee. Now we have entered into the secondary processing level. The secondary processing level is from the parchment and buni, and then you get a new product we call raw or green coffee. This is what we'll find mostly is what is exported in Kenya, and this is where we are losing the coffee returns. Because when we export the raw product, we are missing the, uh, the coffee uh, um, uh, proceeds that can be gotten when we add value in our country. So then from the green coffee, this is where now it is roasted. Now, particularly is done in the consuming countries but I'll show you how we do it here in Kenya. It is roasted, ground, and packaged for consumption. And then, at the end of it all, you can have brewed coffee ready for consumption. Uh, let's see the value addition in our country. Uh, we have a traditional way of selling our low material, that is the green coffee. So Kenya usually sells or exports the low coffee without the value addition with, or with fairly limited value addition practices. And this one can be brought by uh, some reasons that um, I've just highlighted a few. We may not have affordable equipment, we may not afford equipment for value addition and this is due to the high cost of the machinery. And we also have inadequate skills. These inadequate skills, they are concerning the roasting, concerning the grinding, concerning the bleeding, and also concerning the brewing of the coffee. What usually happens is, I have indicated down there that Coffee is not always coffee. So this sentence, coffee is not always coffee, you might be consuming something else thinking that you are consuming coffee. So that is where we want adequate skills and the capacity and the art of brewing. If we don't have adequate skills, 
means that we don't understand coffee. There's no way somebody who does not understand coffee can brew a good cup of coffee. The same thing, somebody who does not understand coffee will not understand the coffee quality. We say that coffee quality goes hard in hard with a good cup of coffee. So you can be consuming coffee, but not coffee. This means that in the skills, we require people who understand coffee, right from roasting, because coffee cannot be roasted like maize or like popcorns. Coffee needs a lot of skills for you to roast. So you require to understand the types of roast, whether the light roast, the medium roast, or the dark roast, depending with the consumer's preference. Because we consider the consumer is the one who dictates to us what he wants. If a consumer requires dark roasted coffee, then give him that. If a consumer requires a medium roast, uh, roasted coffee, please don't give him a light roasted coffee because they will not appreciate the taste of that coffee. This is about roasting. We need people who can roast coffee the right way, considering the different types of roast. When it comes to grinding, for a person to prepare a good cup of coffee, there is need for that person to have the skills for grinding. Because even, because even when it comes to grinding, we have different levels of, uh, of grinding coffee. We have fine coffee, we may have medium uh, grind, we may have coarse grind, and then we may also have very fine. So the different types of coffees that we take, they require different coffee, uh, coffee grind uh, levels. For example, if a customer wants an, an espresso bread, that one you know that it requires very fine uh, coffee grinds. If I need a filtered coffee, I'll need a, a medium or coarse uh, glide coffee. So it requires skills for one to be able to understand the, how to glide the coffee depending with what the consumer wants. There is also the art of brewing, and this is where we have the ballistas in our midst. Uh, we need the ballistas so that they can be able to brew a good quality cup of coffee, cup of coffee. And I was very happy yesterday when our CS, Honorable Munya, said that coffee is not just a cup, it's our lifestyle. It's not just a cup. So when you go or when you are walking along the streets and then you find somebody is brewing coffee, then you need to understand how that coffee is brewed. There's something we call coffee experience whereby the coffee is roasted in your presence, the coffee is ground in your presence, and then the coffee is brewed in your presence. So this is all what we call coffee experience. We need people to experience coffee. That is, that this is where we'll also have people appreciating the coffee fragrance, they appreciate the coffee aroma, and also appreciate the coffee flavors. Uh, there's another uh, hindrance of the value addition, we can call it lack of market or lack of marketing strategies. Coffee cannot be taken to a market like any other product. Coffee is a very unique product. It requires somebody who has the knowledge to be able to sell that coffee. It requires somebody who has the know-how because when somebody does not understand coffee and they are selling coffee to you, they may not be able, you may not be able to understand what is coffee. Uh, one of our previous uh, presenters said that uh, we need to have coffee brewed from our households. But here it's when you understand that people don't understand coffee. When you brew a cup of coffee, somebody will ask you what is that. And in, in our country and mostly in the central region, People call coffee tea. So they are giving you coffee, but they will say that this is tea. So they would ask you whether you will take a cup of tea, and they are giving you coffee. And then I would ask them, 
Why are you referring coffee as tea? And coffee is different from tea. And then they would say, no, you know, we don't differentiate coffee and tea. And there is a problem that even if you give these people coffee, finally they will mix the coffee with tea and then they boil. Because they don't understand coffee. We, there is need for people to understand really what is coffee. And this marketing strategies is where you get one, somebody who knows about coffee to market your coffee. And this is where most of the organizations are failing because I'll get somebody in an exhibition and then I'll ask them what is dark roasted coffee and what is medium roasted coffee and they'll tell you it's, it's coffee. Coffee is coffee. Coffee is coffee. So they don't differentiate. There are different types of coffees in the industry. And when they go to their stores or to our supermarkets and they find the coffee, they cannot be able to differentiate which coffee is which. So there is a need for people to be enlightened on the different types of coffees that we have. And now, because of the country now failing to engage in value addition practices, a study has been done and it has shown that the coffee farmers receive only 7% of the total price of the green coffee. So there are researches that have been done and this is what they have concluded. But we are saying this today, that fariadation, if it is a blessed in a country, it will lead to sustainability of the coffee industry. And I'm very happy because the theme of this conference is sustainable development and economic growth. This is, that is the fariadation will be one activity that will spur the sustainability of the coffee industry and the economic growth. Now, uh, allow me to give you an example of what we do in the university. I'm in Dedan Kemadi University of Technology, and when our earlier presenter, Dr. Apoel, was presenting, he indicated that that is one institution that has embraced the value addition of coffee in Kenya. It is a public university in central Kenya, in Nyeri, and we started the value addition back in the year 2010. There are some various reasons that made us to start the value addition. Number one, the university has a coffee plantation of 116 hectares in coffee. 116 hectares in coffee. There's, we have a fairly, a fairly big plantation of coffee. And secondly, we have a coffee laboratory that allow us to do the research in coffee and this uh, allow us to have the breading without taking our coffee to any other coffee laboratory. It, 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 it gives us the opportunity to blend our coffees and the beauty of the value addition of coffee in our university, it is a research based. We first do the research and then we implement so the value addition at the university, uh, it, it is an activity that was embraced by even by the management. So they gave us the support to start the value addition at the university. The other, uh, the third point why we embrace the, the value addition of coffee is the presence or the existence of the two coffee experts. When you have coffee experts, that is the coffee liquors, they are able to cap the coffee and give you the quality of the coffee. They are able to tell you that this coffee is class 3, this coffee is FAQ, this coffee is class 2, and by that, they were fit to start the coffee value addition in the university because they can understand the coffee. And from there, we started the coffee value addition the year 2010, and now we are in 2022. The first uh, batch we roasted in the university, we roasted two bags of 60 kilograms bags, that is 120 kgs. We roasted 120 kgs, and then we packaged the coffee, and because of the student's population, that is the youth, that coffee was consumed very fast. 
we are talking of the youth to be involved in coffee value chain. So the coffee was consumed very fast because of the population of the students and the population of the staff. Also, the, out, the outside community, we also involved them, and they were able to buy the coffee from the university. Uh, after we, we, we processed the first batch, the excitement that was in the university, we were given more coffee to go and roast and pack. Currently, as we speak, we are roasting 1.2 uh, metric tons annually. I think the university is, is, is losing, is, it's losing a lot of coffee. So the consumption of coffee in the university is very high. Uh, we also have the training and capacity building. This uh, is training the people, like the way another speaker was saying, we need to train the people on how to brew the cup of coffee. They need to be trained on how to roast, on how to blend. Is a cup of coffee is a product that is promoting domestic coffee consumption. When we package the coffee in the coffee lab, then we, the coffee is taken by... There is something that happened in the university that has, that has really promoted the coffee consumption or, from our farm. From the time we started packaging the coffee, it, uh, the, the management decided that they would not be buying coffee from any other outlet. They would be constantly, they gave us a milestone to continue adding value to our coffee. We also have in the university the coffee-based products. This is the brand that is moving very fast in the university. We have other, others like vanilla and strawberry. We have others with shea. But the coffee flavored yogurt is the one that is moving very fast. Then we package the coffee as the university. Uh, you, we, we have the 250 grams packaging where we package the roasted coffee beans. Or if a customer wants the ground coffee, we roast the ground coffee. In the university, we do what the customers want because before we start anything, we do what we call a market research. We also have other products like the cakes that you can use coffee, we, we have used coffee, and having a department in the food science that do a lot of baking, we also give them a coffee to add into their products. Uh, I, will, I will now proceed to why we do the value addition. Why do we do the value addition? Number one is we want to increase the gross margins of the farmers. The, prod, uh, the money or the income from the packaged coffee is direct to the Madame, farmers. Madame Wanji, you have still 10 minutes. So we also have the employment uh, opportunity for the youth and the women. Value addition gives employment opportunity. And we have heard from our previous presenter. And we also increase coffee domestic consumption. Uh, the value addition, we can say that it, it goes hard in hard with the domestic coffee consumption. And we can also say that it's a prerequisite of coffee domestic consumption. If we don't have value addition practices in coffee, then we may not have domestic coffee consumption. And we are also saying that it is feasible. Value addition is very feasible. And now we are asking ourselves, what next? In Kenya, the value added coffee is approximate uh, 1.5 metric tons annually. That is approximate 4%. And we need to, in some of the strategies that we need to undertake. To give an example, uh, in our university, we have collaborated with a daily farm, a daily cooperative society that packages yogurt, and we provide the coffee extract to them, and then they package their yogurt with coffee-flavored bread. So we, we are collaborating with other stakeholders so that they can also use our coffee 
to add into their products. Uh, we also need to enhance the value addition skills, like what I've said. We need to train people on the value addition. And we can also have the zero-related materials for coffee packaging. If we start packaging our coffee, most of the time we source our materials from China and from other places. But if they, they are zero-related, it means that they will be cheaper for us to be able to package. And also, we, we also need to have affordable credit and product diversification. What are we saying? We have some perfumes that can be a product of coffee. We have some body hard wash. We have sh sh shampoos. We have so many products. But this is an area that requires a lot of research. And to conclude, this is what I am saying. Coffee remains the oil of Kenya to greet its economic wheels. We are not going anywhere without value addition. Thank you. You can enjoy a cup of coffee. Merci, Madame Mwangi, pour cette brillante présentation. Donc, Madame Mwangi nous a édifié sur la valeur ajoutée en nous rappelant un peu la définition de celle-ci et en nous expliquant un peu les limites de la valeur ajoutée au Kenya, donc que sont les équipements, les machines, la formation. Et euh, elle nous a également euh, édifié sur les stratégies mises en place justement pour pallier ce problème, notamment euh, d'abord avec un partage d'expérience à l'université, de la transformation du café de la, de la plantation à la tasse qui permet une consommation locale. Et euh, elle a mis en lumière les, les autres stratégies mises en place, notamment la formation, la formation des, des, des acteurs de la, de la chaîne de valeur et euh, le don en équipement. Donc, merci Madame Mwangi. Euh, je vais à présent euh, donner, la, euh, donner la parole à Monsieur Juan Barrios, qui est en ligne, qui fait une présentation virtuelle. Donc, si... Euh, okay. Yes, can, can you see me? Oui, alors... Oui, je vais... Euh, alors, Monsieur Juan Luis, bonjour. Euh, Monsieur Juan Luis... Bonjour. Est le, oui, il est le président de la Specialty Coffee Association. Il est ingénieur en génie chimie industrielle, en chimie industrielle. Et il a un MBA en finance de l'Université Francisco Victoria de Madrid en Espagne. Il est directeur général de Finca La Merced, une exploitation agricole au Guatemala spécialisée dans la production de café de spécialité de foresterie depuis 2008. Il est également directeur général de Andel, une compagnie du Guatemala assurant la commercialisation et la distribution d'intrants chimiques, équipements et consommables en Amérique centrale et à travers le monde depuis 2008. Il est président de Ana, Ana Café, Guatemala, une association de producteurs de café depuis 2020. Alors, Monsieur euh, Barrios Ortega, vous avez la parole. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, greetings from uh, Guatemala. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for the invitation to, to participate on behalf of both the SCA, the Specialty Coffee Association, and of course, Ana Cafe, the Guatemalan Coffee Association. Um, I will go ahead and, and share my screen. Can everyone see it? Yes, okay, excellent, thank you. So um, again, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, as you, you heard, I wear multiple hats. So the presentation is, is coming from uh, essentially all three. Uh, the Specialty Coffee Association, which is a, a worldwide um, association which covers the entire value chain from farmer all the way to um, to uh, the barista and everyone in between the, the value chain. 
then of course the ANA Cafe, the, the Guatemalan Coffee Association, and we focus primarily on uh, producers as a producer association. The exporters, they have their own association, but obviously we have a lot of communication between us. And then of course, I am a third generation coffee grower. And um, usually that's the first hat I, I wear on and, and a lot of what I will be um, commenting is coming from the perspective of a grower uh, and how uh, everyone within the value chain, including government, uh, plays an important role in making sure that all coffee growers can have a, a prosperous and, and thriving uh, living and able to improve Um, regarding the specialty uh, coffee market, um, here are three uh, examples that uh, give us clear data that the specialty coffee market is a growing market. Um, it is when when we look at depending on 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 the numbers, everything is pointing to uh, annual growth above ten percent, which is very robust for any industry in any economy. Uh, so that that is already telling us and giving us signs uh, of where we need to focus our efforts in conjunction to a lot of what Dr. Mwaji uh, just mentioned. So um, I, I like to show this the, this picture because uh, a lot of what we do, and, and in this case, I, I will give the, the Guatemalan uh, experience is we have to have a strong government base, uh, which will allow then the producers to grow. And so if we, if we look at that bottom brick, which is a wider brick, uh, this is that solid government base. Um, as an example, uh, in the case of Ana Cafe, uh, it's uh, a, a precursor to what is now, you know, often uh, considered a public-private partnerships. Um, and why is this that way? Because Ana Cafe is an institution that was actually uh, created by law in Guatemala. However, the board is primarily primarily growers. And the way the way the board is split up, we are twenty members. We have four categories of growers. Each category has four members. So we have small, medium, large. And this is based on the amount of production. So we have equal representation from each one of the categories. So there's not one dominating the other. And then we have a fourth category, which are cooperatives. So those farmers that are organized in cooperatives also have a seat at the table. So that is 16 seats of the 20. And then the remaining four seats are actually named by the government two by the president of the, of the country, and two by the minister of agriculture. So again, this is, uh, and it has worked for us for over 60 years. Um, this uh, union and this working together between the private sector, in this particular case, the growers, alongside government officials, uh, allow us to uh, decide and uh, create policies and strategic direction, uh, which benefits the growers and the local economy, particularly in the case of Guatemala, where coffee is very important uh, because we are present in 60% of the municipalities. We are spread throughout the entire country. And in the case of Guatemala, similar to what Dr. Mwagi just uh, mentioned, uh, coffee side that again, we do have government officials on the board, um, which we give them inputs so that uh, at the government policy level, they can also produce policies that are beneficial, not only for coffee, but for agricultural uh, sector in general. So again, we work hand in hand. And this government, again, this government base is very important because it will allow, um, uh, you know, in this particular case, coffee growers and the coffee value chain in general, um, the framework where we can work. And um, so again, uh, important. 
some of the um, uh, ways in which government can support uh, is creating or pushing towards producer association. Uh, we have the example of, of Guatemala. There are multiple other examples uh, around the world. And I know that many uh, of you already have these types of producer associations. Um, local consumption. This was just now mentioned and I know is going to be a topic uh, further on in, in the summit. Um, is, this is also a topic in the ICO. And here we need to take lessons from countries like Brazil that 20 years ago when we had the, the last major price crisis, even though the, the recent price crisis has also been an issue, but the one 20 years ago was more severe, um, they invested heavily in increasing that local consumption. Uh, and there are many lessons that can be learned from what they did well to increase that local consumption. And a lot of it starts with uh, much of what uh, uh, the professor just mentioned. And it goes around training, particularly barista roasting on how to actually prepare a good, good cup of coffee. And here I want to make a, a quick pause, um, which is something that we are doing within Guatemala, and it's going to differentiate a little bit with uh, the definition of SCA when we're talking about quality when with refers to, to coffee. Typically in SCA, we refer to quality with a complex cup, a, a cup of coffee that has lots of flavors, that has uh, a, a very differentiated um, experience, drinking experience. In Guatemala, we switched the definition to quality being a clean cup, being a uh, coffee that is being well produced with good agronomical practices, with good harvesting practice, practices, with good post-harvesting uh, practices. That for us is a definition of quality because in Guatemala, we do have coffee in different elevations. And we can't expect a coffee that is being grown at 1,000 meters above sea level to have the same cup complexity as a coffee that is being grown at 1,750 meters, which is, for example, my case. Uh, it's just it, it, it's just not possible. Uh, um, God did not intend coffee to taste all the same, and that's why we have the different the 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 different uh, uh, cup profiles. However, uh, it's a disservice to coffee growers uh, who their, their plot of land is at 1,000 meters and they are doing everything they possibly can to uh, produce you know, uh, with good agronomical practices, good harvesting practices, good post-harvesting practices, and they are producing a clean cup. So it's a... It's a slight variation to quality, which does not directly compete uh, with the definition we have at STA, but it's something that I wanted to go ahead and share with you because when we're talking about local consumption, and this has been demonstrated um, in the past with, with data, is when we're able to provide a good uh, quality cup, and here using the definition of a good clean cup, uh, of coffee, consumption increases. So um, uh, again, food for thought uh, when you're uh, devising policies and strategies on how to improve local consumption. Uh, then quality standards, which we are about to listen to. One is at a national level and another is at a regional level. And here's where SEA plays a very important role in helping uh, establish some of these quality standards. Uh, and of course, we are more than happy to be able to help with that. Um, then also uh, something that you can look at is also Pan-African trade amongst the 25 countries that are present uh, here today is what trade policies can you do amongst yourselves to also help support uh, increasing that internal um, Pan-African consumption. Uh, 
tax incentives. This is something uh, that we are currently discussing here in Guatemala at the moment. And here, tax incentives in the sense of with the high cost of fertilizers and agri agricultural um, uh, products like um, or agrochemical products, sorry, uh, like uh, uh, fungicides, herbicides. Uh, we are at a national level, government level, looking at tax incentives into lowering uh, taxes, even the possibility of eliminating the sales tax for these products to lower the cost of production for not only coffee, but the entire uh, agricultural sector. And these are things that you can look at. Also, uh, when we're talking about uh, local consumption, tax incentives for entrepreneurship and adding value, as was just discussed in the previous um, presentation is okay if you're an entrepreneur and you're going to be starting a a small roasting facility or a coffee shop what tax incentives can i give to them to try to um, incentivize them to start up these um uh, these entrepreneur activities and get the the the, the ball rolling then of course research um is very key and here is where we need to work hand in hand with universities who have a lot of the technical expertise and the know-how plus oftentimes the equipment which is not cheap to be able to improve uh, research into how we can improve not only on the growing practices but also on the roasting and also in the coffee prep Operation. And here, again, uh, under SEA, we do have the Coffee Science Foundation, which I'm also a, a part of. And here, as the Coffee Science Foundation within the SEA, we actively are looking not only for research topics and projects, but also different research institutions that want to work hand in hand in looking at all of the opportunities uh, in how we can improve that drinking experience for the consumers. And then uh, last but not least, uh, something that is very key uh, and that basically only government can do is infrastructure um, in the sense of uh, roads, in the sense of access to electricity, access to water. That is very key and anything that the government can do to improve infrastructure capacity is going to help one lower uh, cost of production and do uh, and secondly help incentivize and and kick start some of this movement so amongst all of this and in line with the producer association one of the things that sea does and this is just something that you uh, want to take into account is uh, sea has chapters and SEA chapters involve the entire value chain like we do with, um, uh, throughout the world. However, uh, we do not, as chapters, we do not work with government entities as chapters. So these, the, the chapters do need to be um, it's a, a private, uh, you know, private industry all the way from growers, all the way to, to baristas, including exporters, importers, um, uh, roasters, uh, coffee shops, baristas, the entire value chain, but in the private sector. So any government support that you can, that a coffee producer receives only 7% of the green coffee export price. Um, what, what that means, there's an imbalance in, in the value chain. And this happens to all of effort in trying to sell in a more direct way. So I'm able to capture a much larger percentage of that green coffee export price. Um, but if we do not uh, provide this government support, if we do not provide the proper environment to make, uh, starting with coffee or hundreds of hectares, it has to be profitable. Uh, because if it's not profitable, our youth will not work in coffee. And if the next generation is not involved in coffee producing, everything else we do along the... So we have to find ways uh, in to create more balance to ensure 
that coffee growing and coffee producing is a business, is thriving to ensure that we will have a next generation to be able to continue this. Again, I'm a third generation coffee grower and I, all my effort is try to ensure that my daughter will want to remain in coffee and will want to continue the business of producing coffee. Uh, now we're going to make a quick switch uh, into um, a little bit of branding and positioning on, on, a, uh, on a national level. Um, and internationally, when we're talking about the specialty coffee market, um, there's, it's very little known uh, African coffee producers. Uh, Ethiopia and Kenya uh, are quite well known. Um, those are very, two very well-known uh, specialty coffee uh, suppliers. Uh, I was in Chile uh, last week, and uh, you know you could see Ethiopian and Kenyan coffee, you know, throughout uh, many of the of the coffee shops. However, in with one exception, um, those were the only two African origins that uh, that I found in. Uh, specialty coffee shops. And the exception is because they are a sister company to a UK-based uh, coffee roaster. And in the UK, they have a little bit wider variety of African coffees. Um, next, Uganda is known in certain uh, circles um, in that specialty uh, market, more on the robusta side, uh, Uganda uh, played a very key role in establishing uh, robusta cupping standards with CQI. Um, so again, Uganda is 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 relatively well known, aside from, of course, uh, the, its size of production and a very important player uh, with regards to volume. And then to uh, certain lesser uh, degrees, Rwanda and Burundi are now being um, a little bit more available in uh, the specialty coffee market. But that's only five of the 25 coffee producing nations in Africa. Um, I think Africa has a huge potential. Uh, I liked when I, when I found this image on the internet, I liked it because it demonstrates the diversity that Africa has um, similar to the diversity we have in Latin America. Uh, again, I truly believe there is huge potential uh, for African coffees. I have tasted some wonderful coffees from multiple origins, including um, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, from Malawi, aside from, of course, uh, these five uh, origins. So this is something that, um, again, you need, to, you, you need to work on and focus on, on how to be able to do this. Um, and um, this is uh, branding 101, very simple, nothing too complex. I know that there's more than enough expertise in each one of your countries to be able to, to help and move this, move this forward. But again, just uh, very quickly, you know, when we're talking about branding a, a national uh, brand, and, and here again, I'm going to use the example of Anna Cafe because Anna Cafe promotes Guatemalan coffee. We don't buy and sell coffee like the uh, Federation in Colombia. The FNC in Colombia, they actually buy and sell uh, coffee. So that branding strategy is a little different. Uh, in the case of Guatemala, uh, we, are, we basically only promote um, a, sort of a national brand and each individual producer and exporter do their own thing and, and, and position it uh, wherever, they, wherever they will. But uh, again, five basic branding 101 is who's my audience, where, in, in other words, where do I want to position um, my brand? Uh, this can be by demographics in age, by gender, um, by destination. So, you know, looking at, uh, looking at this, defining, you know, who my audience is going to be, and that's going to play a key role in defining my brand, my logo, the colors, et cetera. Of course, the mission statement, uh, what do I want to achieve with this brand, with this positioning? Uh, what's the messaging going to be? This ties into, of course, to the audience uh, because um, 
different age groups, as you know, need to be uh, spoken to in a different way. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm Generation X. Uh, I was born in 1971. And um, obviously, I grew up uh, in a world where cell phones did not exist yet. Um, you know, I saw the first computer when I was, was almost 15, um, whereas obviously in, in a Gen Z uh, today, you know, it's almost like they're born uh, with a cell phone attached to, to their hands. And just the way to communicate uh, with each generation is different. Um, then the visual identity is going to be, of course, be tied to that brand messaging and to the audience. The color schemes uh, are going to be different. And then, of course, the brand's voice. Um, is, it, uh, you know, is it going to be an inclusive voice? Is it going to be a dynamic voice? Is it going to be a you know, soft-spoken and gentle voice? Um, and, and this is something that, that uh, needs to be defined once you're able to and ready to launch your national brand. Um, that's basically um, what I had to share with you uh, today. Hopefully I was within my, my time limit. Um, there's my, my information. I'm more than happy uh, to help and continue the conversation um, uh, along these lines in any one of my roles, even though I, I will be concluding my roles, my dual role of president of SEA and president of Anna Cafe at the end of this year. But luckily, um, the knowledge stays with us. So um, again, thank you very much for the invitation. Hopefully, I was able to transmit um, some of the experience that uh, we've been able to, to have over the years. Merci. Merci, Monsieur Barrios Ortega. Alors, nous avons euh, été euh, enrichis encore euh, parce qu'il nous a partagé l'expérience de Anna Café et il a mis en avant euh, l'importance des normes, l'importance de la qualité en fonction des origines des cafés. Il a mis en avant euh, l'importance de promouvoir les cafés de spécialité en Afrique pour cent de, des recettes des exportations à travers euh, euh, plusieurs stratégies, notamment... Euh, euh, Je vais noter les stratégies, pardon. Donc, Ruiz Maria, qui est en ligne également. de l'université Cas Western Reserve. Alors, il est spécialiste du café, notamment en qualité, préparation, dégustation et analyse sensorielle. Il est PDG de Friends Coffee, spécialisé dans la vente locale et l'exportation de café transformé au Panama depuis 2014. Il a été consultant formateur pour la formation des jeunes dans le secteur du café. Monsieur Ruiz, vous avez la parole. My experience that and in this case, I'm going to devote this uh, presentation to the very high specialized coffees, uh, which is the, one of the things that is happening today with the coffees from Panama. So as you see, it's, it's something that is, has surprised all of us as producers. We were, even though we are the ones who are receiving these kind of prices, it's still something that surprises us every, every year and how much one product could get from the consumers, from the ones who are going to be paying for that cup of coffee. What is the appreciation? What it is? We need to understand as growers what it is hidden there that help us as growers to do a better job and to understand the value change that we have here. So the first thing that I have here is a map that shows the real size in comparison to each other, the real size of the continents and the real opportunities that we have. When I first been uh, from Panama, this little, uh, when I went to visit Brazil and Minas Gerais, Brazil, I thought the amazing capacity of the coffee producing, and I was kind of very capacity and I see resources 
that is still to be uncovered. And that is something that we as Panamanians have learned being in this small ismos that just receives this particular way of being because of the shape that it is and what we have learned about the terroir, which means where it is the latitude, longitude, altitude, and also those limitations. So how we compete? Well, the only left things to compete was on quality. So uh, locating ourselves in the higher lands of Panama to the western side of it, uh, where the Baru Volcano is, the highest point of Panama, with 1,700 meters above sea level. A coffee arrived in Boquete, this little valley there, around uh, growers in this area. I was photography gives to every coffee producer. And if every coffee producer understands its own uniqueness, is able to develop its own and bigger capacity as such. The case that has put Panama as a coffee leader is the Panama Geisha. Panama Geisha is the varietal that came into Panama later in the early, I would say late 1960s, early 1970s. And it was brought into the country because we were looking for new varieties that will be resistant to some of the diseases that the coffee were having here. Uh, the trend that we received by the late 1970s was as we needed to change our old typicals, already recognized in 1917, there were some of the beautiful Euchre's uh, coffee uh, book was the, from Panama, was little paragraph that says the best coffee is from Boquete, was something that was kept in mind of the producers from this area. So in the trends that we were moved into, um, the late 1970s was we needed to change those varieties that we had here. We needed to change them to more commercial type varieties, caturras especially. So it was a very strong push toward that. But the, the growers here just put some coffee in some areas, some lots, and every variety that was around here would be kept. This was what really saved the geisha because geisha was not a good looking tree, was not a high productive tree, maybe was resistant to, to some of the diseases that we had, but it wasn't that big of a nice, call it that way, product that we were expecting, but it was kept. And in, after that, in 2003, was discovered in one of the farms in a lot, by Mr. Daniel Peterson, who observed that what part of this variety has really shown some good uh, resistance to some, uh, to some climate change. And it was then taken and tried as a different lot, as a different product that we needed to try. So what was the key to develop this Panama Geisha was the fact that we had it available. It was not removed from the coffee areas. And part of what the growers have to do is that to keep its own research area where they can try different varieties because trying different varieties doesn't take five years. It takes 20 years, it takes 30 years. So it's something that the trends, sometimes we have the trends that tells us what we need to do, but maybe that is not the correct thing for that particular locality. So in this case, we were able to save not only that variety, but other varieties that later on were discovered and great varieties that we are also now improving and uh, promoting around the growers. So in this case of Panama Geisha, then has other things to do with the fact that Panama has not a major group or a major institution that governs the, coffee, uh, the, the growers or the coffee industry. So the growers were left at its own to develop what they could develop. And the growers were, were ready. Because for instance, in 1983, I myself was in charge of designing cup profiles for the local market. So we started to, do, to went into this specialization already early on. So in 19, uh, or is the 1987, I became a coffee copper. So the growers were getting into this new segment of having 
the power to understand their own capacity, their own resources. That was key because we could move fast and we could do things together. Panama is the only run by growers, 100% run by grower, a cupping competition. So is the grower that's received the knowledge and is the grower that knows what is happening with the product. So in this case, what is the specialty then? It is attention to details to where bringing out the optimum performance of every stage and of every location. So there is a space for everyone in this new segment because it's a new segment. Coffee industry is a very young industry. So we are developing areas. We are in the process of understanding our own product. And one thing that we understood very well, that is that for inputs into the specialty, we not only need the seedling and the fertilizer, the land and the technical assistance, we really need at that level, understand what is our terroir? What is our capacity of craftsmanship? What is our field team? We need a specific field teams. We need coping teams. And this is at the level of growing, which means that the growers will have to have the capacity to roast, taste their own coffee, and also what they are doing with their own coffee, and also what they find in their own areas. This is the key to discover what we have as potential that we don't really know, which is the case of, for instance, Geisha. Because it was the terroir, because we had the current machine, because there was a field team, because Mr. Peterson knew how to cup, then he was able to separate this cup as something special, something different. In fact, many of us would consider that not a good cup of coffee, but that is not the point because we were not the consumer for that coffee. We also need to understand what is the cons what the consumer requires and what is that what consumer buys. In this case, we need to move then into the specialty coffee value chain in context because it is a dynamic development. This whole thing is not static. It is moving all the time. So the task is an ongoing assessment of means and resources. We know to know which, which in each part of our segment of the value chain, what we have, how we have it, what is the development that it is? How much we have invested it? Because it's in the value chain that is supported, as it's been explained before, by the government entities, by the coffee organizations, by the research centers that do the kind of research that the growers are needing, that then the, value, the next steps of the value chain. But at the beginning, I have to stress here that in order to find the highly specialized coffees, it is at the level of the growers that we need to emphasize the capacity of becoming great coppers. What we have found now, for instance, is that for particular farms, Geisha will have the potential or its higher potential in a very particular time of the crop. It's not all the crop. It's just a very particular week of the whole crop that it will show the highest potential of that variety. And those are the lots that will go to compete and to the e-auction. And what does that represent? It represents a motivation for growers to do the job. That is a job that takes time, takes a lifetime. For instance, right now we are testing new varieties of taking eight or 10 years to be developed because we only had one tree. So we needed to plant more trees so we could wait three, four, five years and see what happens with that variety and put it to the competition. This process can only be done at the growers level. The rest of the value change has to wait until what the grower does. If the growers doesn't have the capability to do this, we are at the expenses of losing major resources that are out there major varieties, specific varieties that we have not even known that is there. But if the growers become researchers themselves, they will provide to the industry new varieties, new ways of preparations of uh, post-harvest, 
because they are able to, ta to taste what is that they are doing that is correct and repeat it. If they don't do that, then who will do it? We are missing part of the potential on that route. Then, what are the keys for successful and sustainable specialty coffee segment development? We always have to apply systems approach. It's not only one part, it's not only the tree, it's not only the phys physiology of the tree or the variety, it's the soil where it is located, it is how it works with the climate that is surrounded and how much it is put into that system. Next, we need to do changes based on positive economy. We cannot put the pressure on people that will have to invest and not receive a benefit. For a value change to be successful, the whole value change needs to receive direct benefits. The next thing is to practice and exercise toward precision. We need to be more precise. We need to understand exactly what kind of pruning we need to do to the coffee, what type of fertilization we need to do to it based on our location, based on our sunlight, based on other details that right now we don't think about. No, it is more localized. There is no more that the general, what we have found for very high specialized coffees, even within farms, we are uh, identifying lots, that these are lots that will behave very well for certain varieties, but do not do it with other varieties. The next thing is to move toward vertical integration. And we do move toward vertical integration when we create our coping team at the producer levels. Everybody learns how to roast in order to cop. Everybody, this team needs to know how to roast well in order to have a very good evaluation of the cop. This in reality will give the feedback that is needed to do a better job. That by itself is vertical integration. The expansion of that vertical integration, when you do branding, when you do packaging, that's another step. But the basic step is to integrate our own concept of how to evaluate the result of what we are doing as growers. And that generates two things. Knowledge that we need, like the experience. Why do we need experienced people to be at the farms? because they are the ones who can talk to the wind. They can listen to the wind. They can listen to the signs that we are not able to hear them, but they know what it is. So that knowledge needs to be appreciated. And every farmer that has been in its own farm for 20 years understands very well what it means. And that is called terroir. And then we need to take advantage of the technology. Technology is at hand right now. And the infrastructure to help with that technologies can be provided for the government, can be provided for the support system that will provide for the growers the opportunity to enhance and to perform better. And at the bottom part, what we have for highly specialized products, we need to create trust, credibility, and accountability. If I'm selling a coffee that is $4,000 a kilo, I have to be trusted that what it goes into the package is what I said it is, and it tastes what I say it tastes, and it tastes all the way through from the growers to the consumer. As trust, credibility, and accountability in business are key. If we don't have those, it's very easy that we won't be able to develop and take advantage of the opportunities that we have at this part of the business. So why not to go from the green bean to the golden brown bean? At the end is this decision. This is a decision that we have to make because it takes part of who we are. It takes courage from us to face whatever it will take, to take the route that will might be the next 25 years but 25 years goes by quite fast. But if we need to take it, let's take it. Because what we have in our hands is the resources that God has provided us with and we are stewards 
of that. It is our duty to do the best we can with that. Thank you very much. Uh, merci, Dr. Ruiz. Alors, merci, Dr. Ruiz. Uh, nous avons uh, compris uh, comment uh, augmenter uh, la production et la qualité, notamment uh, uh, la valeur ajoutée, uh, à, par à partir d'une démarche participative qui uh, implique le producteur, qui implique le producteur uh, depuis uh, la sélection variétale, jusqu'à la transformation, jusqu'au consommateur, euh, et aussi euh, par euh, euh, le, la connaissance des, des, des consommateurs, donc de leurs besoins. Alors, euh, merci encore pour ces, euh, ces lumières qui, euh, qui permettent justement de produire euh, un café de spécialité, un café euh, de, ayant une forte valeur ajoutée. Merci, Dr. Ruiz. Je vais enfin donner la parole à monsieur, à monsieur qui, qui saurait, Ruben. Alors, monsieur, monsieur J. Sauré. Il est master en études de développement de l'Université Homo Kenyatta pour l'agriculture et la technologie. Il prépare en ce moment un doctorat en études de développement. Il a une très grande expérience dans les questions de stratégie en matière de normalisation et d'évaluation de la conformité. Il est actuellement directeur technique de l'ARSO, euh, basé au Rwanda. Monsieur Chisore, la parole est à vous. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we had a mishap at the beginning, and I think it was for a good reason, uh, because eventually when you are doing standards, what informs you is all the research that has been done and experiences that have been gathered. So I will give my presentation. Uh, it's on value addition uh, in coffee and African coffee standards. So that will cap up what you've uh, learned uh, for the today's session in the afternoon. It also captures part of what was done in the morning. So if we can, um, oh, okay. I think I'm the one with the, this. so uh, ARSO is the African Organization for Standardization that was established in 1977. That time we had the African uh, Organization of African Unity and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. Now the purpose for establishing this organization was uh, to harmonize uh, the national or regional standards to African standards. So if it's a standard that we find in one country, it is harmonized, becomes a standard for the whole continent. And the second part is to promote and coordinate uh, standardization and conformity assessment. Conformity assessment will include issues of uh, testing, issues of uh, inspection, and giving certification. Uh, the, the third point is to have a regional certification scheme. And that scheme, as you will see later on, is what we use for purposes of ensuring that if we certify the product uh, in Kenya, for example, it's given a mark, and that mark is demonstrating that the product complies with an African standard, then that product should be accepted in all the five countries of the continent. Now, as an intergovernmental body, uh, it means your government and most of the government organizations uh, or the governments in Africa or those who are present here, you are represented. Uh, the headquarters are in Kenya uh, and currently we have 42 members uh, or 42 African members signed up as members of the organization. Uh, so the rest, uh, we are still in the process of ensuring that we can get all of them uh, to register. So for coffee, we understand, and the basis is that from, UK, from the time you came here, you understand that it's highly traded, uh, second to petroleum, but there is that demand for a certified product. What do you mean by a certified product? The product that is of good quality, it is safe, and it does not cause harm. Now, the safety of the product is c coming from the point of view that uh, where you grow it, you practice good agricultural practices. Uh, you do not use 
illegal or banned uh, pesticides. Uh, you do not use water that is harmful. It doesn't have heavy metals, for example. And you ensure that the good agricultural practices uh, give you uh, the beans that do not have, for example, high levels of ocratoxin that would be harmful to you. So the, then you look at the quality of the product. The standards will define the defects that you find in the beans, the defects that you find once you do the roasting or whatever you do, and the organoleptic properties that you, you need to find that are suitable for the product to be considered as good coffee. I think I don't want to go into that po point where you've been given all the information about the test. But there are those organoleptic properties that ensure that the, the product is uh, testing the right way as advertised. And therefore, we are also looking at when you grow coffee, there are those associations of coffee with exploitation of the, the people who do the, the growing, those who do the picking, those who do the processing and all that. So we are looking at the sustainability chain uh, that you ensure socially, uh, economically, and environmentally that these are sustainable practices. Uh, <clears throat> so the standards we currently have, and as you can see from the presentation you had from Dr. Regina, is that we reached the point of selling the green beans, and that is the tragedy that we are trying to reverse, that we actually need to go to the point where we produce what the consumers uh, want. So the, the, the standards that we have are currently reach that point where you have uh, green beans that are for sale. You don't proceed even to roasting. And for that matter, you find that even accessing uh, the coffee itself, much as we are blaming people for not taking coffee, it becomes difficult for people to access the coffee because what we are selling are the green beans. So the, the approach that we are looking at now, right now is to get a value addition that gives us the product which the consumers want. Uh, instead of waiting to get instant coffee coming from uh, Switzerland, and then we do the repacking and indicate that it is made in Kenya or whatever, which is not the kind of um, business we want to do. So, we have, you know, poor uh, cons consumer perceptions. First of all, the availability is not that high. If actually you went to most of the markets or the supermarkets, you find that the availability of the coffee that you would want to consume is not that high. Where it is available, it's unaffordable, consider if you compare that with the other alternatives. Then there's the, uh, these, these enduring uh, claims that it is harmful. If you recall, for those who are you know, in Kenya, when we used to have our kahawa number one, yeah, a very good aromatic kind of coffee. I don't see it anymore. And there was a movement telling us that coffee was harmful. And therefore, you don't give it to your children. Yeah, you don't take it because it will give you hypertension. Uh, someone mentioned that. I don't think we need to persist with those kinds of myths. I say they are myths because studies have been done that demonstrate that the, the coffee has benefits much more than what we are being told. That actually, if you consume it, it is better for you in terms of health. And for those who want to check, you can read. This information is available. So that kind of information is what we need to demystify to remove it so that people can go back to consuming coffee. We used to consume it when we were in university, and it used to be, I think it's still a stable for people who are in colleges, uh, if you really want to concentrate and study. I don't see anybody getting hurt or getting you know, unhealthy from that kind of consumption. Then we have the aspect that most of the coffees that we, we, we have um, they are not culturally, you know, attuned to our tastes. And this is something that I, need, I think our research institutions need to work on. Someone does research elsewhere, they bring you the coffee, they tell you it is good, they give you all the attributes. But is it 
really the kind of test, your test buds, can they, you know, get attuned to that? Sometimes you get it, you try to take it, it doesn't test the way you would have wanted to test. Can we do research that is relevant to our consumption uh, practices, to our cultural tests? I believe it is possible. And I think in the universities, that's what we really need to work on. So that we, we are not waiting for the cappuccinos, we are not waiting for, you know, um, espressos and all that. What we can also do at product development that responds to our own tests. Now you find that this is where we are failing uh, completely so that we are only waiting for others to do their product development, then we take it with a tag of 4,000 US dollars per kilo. I believe that there's nobody who can afford that in Kenya unless, you know, there are those high-end people can do that. But for a common person, that is completely out of you know, the blues, they, can, they cannot take it. Then we need to look at the aspects of the growing areas. How is the environment treated? How are the people treated? Is it economically viable? Um, from my personal background, we used to grow coffee. It is what educated us. At some point, it became unsustainable. And my parents had to uproot it because it was occupying land that we could use for other purposes. Economically, it was not viable. Socially, it was not viable. So can we make sure that this is viable? Then there's the movement for organically produced coffee. Can we respond to that? And we need to demonstrate that we can do that. So the diversity of the coffee products that we have Mainly, uh, and I'm happy that I saw the research from the university that is incorporating coffee in yogurt, uh, in cakes, in you know, biscuits and such. Predominantly, you don't find anything that resembles what you get for, with cocoa. Can we have coffee products that resemble the cocoa bar, chocolate bars, for example? Can we have biscuits that have you know, coffee. Can we have cookies that have coffee? We don't have. So the only consumption uh, route that we have is getting a cup of coffee. And I think that is where we are also not doing very well. So we need to look at the diversity of the products that we can incorporate coffee into, and then we can promote local consumption. So there's need to explore inclusion of coffee in a diverse range of products in the dairy sector, which I think has already started and other aspects. Take into account African tastes. Don't ignore that. Don't always focus that you are going to export. From current trends, you can see that markets fail, international markets fail. And when they fail, you are stuck with products that you have not accustomed yourselves to consuming. And what happens? We suffer economically. So we need to do that. So we are open to receiving at ARISO and proposals in which uh, we are looking at value-added products that correspond to our needs in the continent and developing new standards in those areas that can promote those products for consumption. So currently we are looking at, and this is something that uh, IACO founders already started and we said we are going to collaborate. We are looking at sustainable coffee, uh, which will be having an eco-label that assures you that whoever is involved in that value chain is benefiting. They are not using child labor, they are not exploiting the workers, and the land is taken care of. Then we are also looking at organic coffee production, uh, including its own certification. So those are things that we are currently engaged in, and we recognize that coffee supports livelihoods. As I gave you that testimony, part of my education was supported by uh, coffee. And as young children, of course, we had to appreciate the fact that it is what was paying our coffee, it is what was buying us uniforms, and we used to pick that coffee. Hand-picked you know, coffee, and you, you are trained on how to pick the right one, that is ripe 
to be the cherry that is that's ripe and correct to, take it, to be taken to the coffee factory and the one that we actually use for drying, using the drying root, so that it becomes, you know, the processed asimbuni, the way we call it in Kenya. So, our perception is that uh, we need to support the coffee sector with standards, with certification, and with product development aspects that enable us uh, to make it a viable and strategic commodity in the continent. I wish to stop at that point, and we welcome any questions that may arise. Thank you very much. Merci. Euh... Alors, merci, Monsieur Chisore, Monsieur Gisore, et euh, nous comprenons que l'augmentation de la consommation locale, de la valeur ajoutée, passe par le développement des, des normes locales aussi, en fonction des goûts, hein, en fonction de, de, des besoins des consommateurs africains. Donc, euh, les qualités organoleptiques du café doivent euh, répondre à nos besoins spécifiques. Donc, euh, la recherche doit être orientée vers ces, euh, ces normes locales, vers euh, ces, euh, euh, ces variétés euh, qui, euh, qui, 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 qui donnent un café euh, de, au, goût, au goût varié, voilà, au goût riche. Euh, merci. Euh, pour cette présentation euh, riche de M. Gisoré. Euh, nous allons à présent passer à la période de questions. Questions. Alors, je vais, nous allons prendre les questions et euh, par la suite, je donnerai la parole aux panélistes qui y répondront. Il n'y a pas de questions. Tout a été clair. Oui, madame. Oh, merci. Bonsoir. Uh, my name is Linda Busiene. I work for AFRISAT. AFRISAT is a certification body. We are accredited against ISO 17065 and we are approved by various standard owners across the agribusiness world. My focus would be to um, Mr. Gisare about the standards. Um, a comment and a question. There needs to be a culture shift. It has been a norm that commodities, not just coffee, that is produced for local consumption, is, it doesn't have to be safe. You can take an example of um, the horticulture business. When uh, they are rejected by EU because of MRLs, they are brought straight to our supermarkets, and our local people actually consume them. So uh, my question would be, the local standards that we are creating, how do we ensure that there's compliance? I mean, most standards are just about sustainability, and they tie or marry into each other. So if there's a standard here, even in the EU, the, the, the same organic standards would have um, conversations revolving around sustainability. So how do we ensure compliance? Number two, the greatest barrier to um, adoption of certification is the cost. Will there be or are there policies that can be put in place to ensure affordability? Thank you. Uh, 
Merci, madame. Oui, monsieur Alzil. Check the batteries. Are okay? Merci, c'est Alexis Tunkara de la Confédération interprofessionnelle des producteurs de café de Guinée, et président de la cellule technique pour la promotion de la filière en Guinée. Ce n'est pas une question, mais c'est vrai, c'est pour confirmer un peu ce que le docteur vient de dire en relation même avec l'avant-dernière thématique. Les deux thématiques se rejoignent. Il n'y a que des petites différences. C'est vrai, il nous revient parfois de faire des petites expériences, même avec des analphabètes. Dans le cadre de la valorisation de la consommation interne du café. Il est arrivé un temps où on a fréquenté un café, on a demandé à celui-là, il ne parle pas, il ne crie pas, il ne fait rien, mais il nous a dit quelque chose qui nous a intéressé en tant que producteur. Alors, s'il achète, parce que l'an dernier, au cours de, du lancement du programme café de, de la commercialisation, le prix euh, comment dire, plancher était à 12 000 francs guinéens. Donc, je vais dire unité monétaire. À 12 000 unités monétaires, le prix plancher. Et alors, le paysan ou le producteur qui vend ce café à celui qui fait l'entreprise, son petit kiosque, il va le torifier et il le prépare. 2 litres. Et chaque litre lui donne 40 000 unités monétaires. C'est-à-dire 40 000 francs. Les 2 litres, ça fait les 80 000 francs. Imaginez-vous, lui, il a acheté à 12 000 avec le producteur de la localité. Il est allé chez le, le torréfacteur, il a payé 1 000 francs, ce qui fait 13 000. Et il en a eu 80 000. Lorsqu'on enlève 13 000 de 80 000, cette différence. Ça nous dit que nous avons intérêt à promouvoir la consommation locale. Non seulement il emploie deux personnes jeunes qui ont fini d'université, mais aussi il gagne une valeur que le producteur ne gagne pas. Alors je crois qu'il est très intéressant de démultiplier ces initiatives au niveau de la base. C'est un grand regret lorsque j'ai demandé tout à l'heure à mon ami camerounais j'ai dit dans le groupe, est-ce qu'il y a un acteur Il m'a dit non, il n'y a que l'administration qui est venue. Et tout de suite, j'ai vu M. Koulibaly. J'ai dit, si je pouvais rencontrer euh, mon frère de la Côte d'Ivoire, que je vais rencontrer tout à l'heure pour échanger. Ça, c'est pour dire que désormais, il faut que les acteurs participent à ce sommet. Parce que c'est une véritable université. Quel que soit ce que l'administration viendra apprendre ici, ils n'auront pas un centre d'application. Parce qu'ils ne vivent pas, ils n'ont pas la main dans le café. Eux, c'est nos partenaires. Et parfois même, ce sont, nos, bon, ce sont nos, nos services techniques. Donc, encore une fois, je fais le plaidoyer pour que prochainement, vraiment les acteurs du café, de la production jusqu'à la transformation soient présents entre nous. Je vous remercie. Merci, monsieur. Veuillez remettre le micro à, au monsieur qui est juste en face de moi, s'il vous plaît. Madame, juste en face de moi. Merci pour la parole. Je m'appelle Biloso Moene Apollinaire. Je suis professeur à l'Université de Kinshasa, à la Faculté des sciences agronomiques et directeur de cabinet du ministre de l'Agriculture de la République démocratique du Congo. Je voudrais renchérir les propos de la dame qui venait de parler sur euh, les formations sur la certification. Cela coûte énormément cher pour certains pays et je me demande comment faire pour rendre cela flexible 
pour les pays qui en souffrent. Deuxièmement, j'ai bien suivi l'exposé de Mme Regina tout à l'heure. Euh, il se pose un problème pour renforcer la consommation locale du café dans nos pays. Cela passe par nos traditions, comme l'avait soulevé euh, notre collègue de la Côte d'Ivoire. Mais maintenant, quelle stratégie mettre en place pour que les activités liées au marketing pour la consommation locale puissent donner un effet Parce que euh, c'est les revenus que les gens procurent qui attirent souvent. Les gens ont tendance d'exporter, de vendre au lieu de consommer. Comment faire pour renforcer la consommation locale Merci. Merci, monsieur. Y a-t-il euh, d'autres questions ou contributions Madame, mademoiselle Thank you. Uh, my name is Faith Karemi from uh, uh, the second biggest coffee producer in Kenya, that is Coffee Nav Coffee Company. Uh, my question is about all some observation when we are selling uh, our coffees when it comes to the quality standards. At the market destination, uh, the basis of price discovery is based on the Q grading, that is the, the point score. But when you come to the producer origin, you find that, like the Kenya case, we talk about classification. So to the people that are concerned, the doctor concerned on standards, is there a way that we can, there can be harmony between the export des destination uh, quality standard, that's the scoring, uh, versus the producer's uh, classification. Because both of them do contribute to a very great extent on the price discovery. And from experience, we may find that a coffee that has been classified as per Kenya standard as class 3 will not manage the scores as per the Q grading for specialty um, market or a specialty coffee. And that compromises the price. And uh, as producers at the origin, we feel that we have done the best, we have produced the best coffee, but we are not getting a fair price. Thank you. Merci, madame. Une... Une... Uh, thank you so much, Madam Chairperson and Moderator. My name is John Moneke. I'm a farmer. And a question I would like to ask, which probably to the professor from, Moy, from Kimad University. Uh, I didn't hear much about the sanitary and phytosanitary conditions, which are critical in terms of the product aspect. Secondly, is the whole question of um, the non-tariff barriers. I know you're talking about processing, whether at home processing, in a restricted area, or even processing maybe in some factory somewhere and making it available. And then a question of the shelf life of that particular aspect. Then a supplementary question, when you're doing export to the European Union, the highest standards in the European Union is actually the Swiss standards, even higher than the WTO, World Trade Organization standards, or World um, International Property Organization, or, or all those standards. It's much, much higher. And if then you want to to export in some of those places, then we have to game up our standards. I didn't hear you say anything about that, but maybe you might want to address that. Thank you, madam. Merci. Merci, monsieur Manik. OK, on va prendre une, une autre question. Bonjour, uh, merci. Euh, je voulais juste intervenir par rapport, disons, euh, aux questions de normes. Euh, je me dis aujourd'hui que c'est tellement important 
en fait, les exposés qui ont été euh, portés à l'attention en fait, de, des participants. Mais je me dis qu'il est important quand même d'insister sur ces questions. Peut-être que euh, monsieur le présentateur, concernant, par rapport au nom, va euh, nous, euh, nous donner des, des informations plus claires là-dessus. C'était par rapport, disons, aux normes euh, internationales. Euh, nous savons que la plupart de nos pays euh, continuent à exporter sur un certain nombre de marchés euh, qui sont en, encore loin de nous, tels que le marché international. Et nos pays sont aussi des pays producteurs, mais généralement, les pays, nous, en tout cas en Guinée, euh, pour l'élaboration des normes, on se refère à la norme internationale, parce que nous visons, en fait, pour le moment, un marché international. Et donc, je ne sais pas comment... Euh, le, le présentateur pourra nous mettre en lien la norme que, qu il, dont il vient de présenter par rapport, disons, à cette norme internationale qui est aujourd'hui une référence de la plupart, en fait, des pays qui exportent sur le marché international. Ça, c'est par rapport, disons, au café vert. Mais quand nous prenons aussi le café transformé, je pense qu'il y, y, a, y a deux niveaux de normes. Le norme sur le produit qui est transformé, mais également sur les emballages. Qu'est-ce qu'il peut nous en dire là-dessus Merci. Merci, monsieur. Alors, si nous n'avons plus... Euh, vous avez une contribution. Allez-y. Madame Par ici, s'il vous plaît. Madame Mademoiselle Bon. Ok, c'est bon. Allez-y. Okay. Good afternoon. All protocols observed. My name is Prudence Jackie, and this is a contribution to the uses of coffee. Mostly, uh, as the professor asked, uh, can we uh, can we add coffee to cookies and all other pastries? To me, it's an addition to beauty and health because uh, in beauty world, we use coffee mostly as a scrub on our, um, um, for our skins and also as a hair product, I mean, in the hair products, like you can add honey and create a, a, a hair treatment. And also in our health system, like you can see, I'm a full-figured woman. But I know in once in a while I take coffee with lemon that works very well and tones my weight where it is there to increase my metabolism. Merci. Merci, madame. Une dernière question. Nous allons prendre une dernière question. Euh, juste en face de moi. En avant. Juste en avant. Merci, madame la modératrice. Euh, je suis Fernand Kofi, en charge de la promotion café au niveau de la Côte d'Ivoire, au niveau du Conseil du Café Cacao. Alors, pour la question des normes, euh, nous devenons de plus en plus embêtés parce que euh, ça nous fatigue. On a nos normes au niveau de chaque État, on a les normes que l'ARSO nous recommande, mais en même temps, on a les normes de l'Union européenne et de, au niveau de l'international. Ça commence à devenir un problème tellement euh, difficile à gérer que souvent je me demande si l'Occident euh, ne nous fait pas danser au gré de leurs intérêts ou au gré de leurs volontés. Selon qu'ils ont bu un café qui est acide, on nous dit qu'il ne faut pas cultiver le café euh, en coupant la forêt. Selon qu'ils sont contents, il faut alors euh, exporter ou produire le café dans telle ou telle condition. Alors, la, réa la réelle euh, question que je me pose, c'est qu'est-ce que nos États font pour que des normes, soit des normes qui nous concernent, nous tous, que nous approuvons et que nous essayons d'en discuter avec nos partenaires extérieurs parce que pour la plupart du temps, nous sommes obligés d'exporter de, une partie de notre café euh, au-delà de la petite partie que nous consommons. Donc nous sommes obligés en ce moment d'adresser la question des normes. 
Moi, je pense qu'il faut qu'on on y réfléchisse véritablement, qu'on arrête quelque chose et qu'on ne soit pas euh, à suivre les exigences parfois euh, non fondées de nos partenaires extérieurs. Merci. Merci, monsieur. Merci pour vos questions à tous. Nous allons à présent donner la parole aux panélistes qui vont tenter de répondre à celle-ci. Les panélistes qui ont été, enfin, qui sont surtout concernés par ces questions sont monsieur Gisore et madame Mwanji. Toutefois, si monsieur Juan et docteur Maria Ruiz veulent intervenir, euh, ils, sont, ils seront invités à le faire. Donc, je vais d'abord donner la parole à Mme Mwanji, qui va répondre. Nous avons au total cinq questions. Thank you. Uh, there is a question I didn't get from the back there. It was very, the volume was very low. So, can you kindly repeat the question? as I answer the one for faith. Uh, thank you, Madam. The question is about, um, in the presentation, there's a lot of research that's going on and we appreciate the good work and effort you're doing. But some of the restrictions come because of sanitary and phytosanitary conditions under the World Trade Organization. These countries, they trade with other countries under those regulations. Now, when it comes to trade and non-tariff barriers, again, there are certain barriers that are put across there. And these have an effect on the shelf life of the product that you're going to put in the market. Much more so, I can even add the whole question of the logistical aspects. Because now after the COVID, shipping anywhere to Europe, to North America, or even to Asia, sometimes even the shipping lines are not available. And that still has an effect on the shelf life of the product. Now, if you want to export to the European Union, what happens is that the European Union has got their standards, but the highest standards in the European Union are the Swiss standards. So it might be acceptable in the European Union, but it may not be acceptable in Switzerland. They are the highest standards. So when you talk about improving our standards, we need to hear from you what your recommendation is and how we need to go about that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will start with the question that was asked by Kalemi uh, about the harmonization of the coffee standards, because I'm also in coffee standards, and the part I will not answer, it is for the answer. Uh, in Kenya, we have, we had, let me talk of we had, because we are now harmonizing our coffee standards. Uh, we have, every country has its own classification method. Kenya, we have our own classification method. Uganda has, Brazil has, Panama, every country that produces coffee, they have their own grading system. But we have SCAR. We have the Q grader or the Q grading that harmonizes the whole world. Because if all the countries that are producing coffee, each and every country has its own different grading, then it means that we, have, we need to have one that can harmonize. That is why here in Kenya, we have two certifications. We have Coffee Likala, who is certified to cup the coffees in Kenya. But then we have another certification, that is the, the, the SCAR, the Q grading, whereby you can cup coffee the whole world. So the Q grading sort of harmonizes the grading of the coffee. So when we go outside the country, we use the Q-Grader because every person in this world understands the Q-Grading. But because of the different species that we have in our countries, we cannot grade the Arabica coffee the way Robusta coffee is graded. So that is why we have different grading systems in our national or in our countries, and then we have the one, the overall, that cuts across all the countries, that is the Q-Grading. Uh, then I come to the question that has been asked about the shelf life. Uh, we have the coffee that is being value added in our country, and we don't only add coffee, uh, value to coffee to consume in our country, 
Nowadays, we are even exporting uh, value-added coffee. We are exporting roasted coffee beans, and the issue of self, uh, shelf life has come up, and people have been talking about the shelf life, that by the time the coffee gets to the other side eh, of the consuming country, that the shelf life is very short. So what we do is that we use the light packaging materials that can preserve the shelf life of that product. So if, for example, we just sell the low or the green coffee to safeguard the shelf life, it means that the roasted coffee beans can also be, can also be shipped because if you package using the light packaging, like if I give an example, we use the one way valve because the coffee is an enemy. The coffee is a, a sorry, the oxygen is an enemy of coffee because of oxidation. So we try to make sure that the packagings that we are using, the coffee cannot uh, access or the oxygen cannot come into contact with the coffee. So most of the time when we are shipping the coffee or when we are exporting the coffee, we use the one way valve that allows the carbon dioxide to get out and not allow oxygen to get into the package. We also have pressurized packaging that you first uh, flush the packaging bags with the nitrogen and then from there you package your coffee. So your coffee is safe up to the point of destination. So that is where we take care of the shelf life. And the other issue of the, uh, of the standards you are talking of the standards and the coffee. Uh, like, when we are talking of shipping the coffee, there are the requirements that are required for you to ship coffee. These allow us to, at least to take care of the quality of the coffee. We cannot allow anybody who comes and uh, want to ship coffee, just to ship coffee the, the way they want, because we are taking care of the health of the consumer from the other side. So we need to take care of our coffee. That's why you, there are these requirements. Before shipping the coffee, you need like the phytosanitary and all that. There's a list of requirements that are, that are there for you to be allowed to ship any coffee. Because we are taking care of our health and are the care of those people who consume our coffee. So f for these requirements to be met, that is why we have the coffee standards that also direct us on what to do. And that is now the point. I will leave to uh, Gizoli to continue because he's in the harmonization of these standards. But I, I, I come back to faith. We have the East African standards because we have been harmonizing the East, Afri uh, East African standards. That is our East African countries. We were harmonizing the standard, but now we have gone ahead to also, whereby we are standardizing the standard. We are harmonizing the standards in the whole African country. Thank you. Merci, Dr. Mwangi, pour toutes ces, pour tous ces éclaircissements. Je vais donner la parole à M. Hissore pour la suite des questions. Thank you, Madam Moderator, and uh, thank you all, uh, those who asked questions and all those who gave comments. I will start with uh, our colleague from AFRISAT, uh, an organization that uh, we are currently engaged with, I think, um, through our conformity assessment committee. Uh, one, it is, uh, uh, may I say it is a sad case. You know, uh, since I work at a, an, an African organization of which Kenya is a member. I, I wouldn't want to really say what Kenya should do or not do uh, because Kenya is our member. Now, the fact is that uh, from our perception and from good you know, practices, you start with your own internal uh, market. You make sure that it is at the same level or even better than actually those that you are trading with outside. But I don't understand the kind of mindset that still persists, not only in Kenya, but it persists across Africa, that locally we don't care what people consume. Locally we don't care 
how the infrastructure for our market is. Locally, we don't care what kind of pesticides, herbicides, and whatnot are used to ensure that our people are safe. You know, have a country, when your people are poisoned and you are spending a lot of money treating them with cancer or tumors and whatnot, all these things, it is not right. So my appeal would be to look at the food safety authorities. We have AFA. And what needs to be done? And when you look at any of the local markets, and I think this is one of the things people know that I always advocate, that we would need to have good markets for selling our products. Look at the way they are hooked. They are put on a pile of rubbish. Most times that pile is on the roadside. It has a lot of contaminants. And much as you may do the cleaning, you know those met heavy metals you can't clean. They will be in the food and we get sick. Actually, some of the standards that we are going to be doing are on how you design a fresh vegetables market, a meat market, a fish market, all these things. We are going to do that, and we are going to have model standards for that. But I would say that if the product is rejected on account of MRLs in the EU, that product is not suitable for any Kenyan or even an animal in Kenya. That product should be destroyed. It should never be allowed into any outlet for human consumption. So those are the standards. We don't have two standards. And if you look at even the Kenyan standards, they don't say this is a category for export, this is a category for uh, internal use. No, they don't. We don't have that kind of a, a standard. I was in Kenya Bureau of Standards and I know that. So let's have a uniform standard that is used for export is the same that is used for imports. Really, I think we are human beings, all of us. We are not lesser humans than the ones that we are exporting to. Now, on account of the differences in standards, I think in the EU, you know, Switzerland is not in the EU. So they are allowed to have a variation of their own kind of systems. So in those, those are unique circumstances that you need to look at when you are exporting so that you are looking at the destination market, and then you can meet those uh, requirements. I agree that, uh, you know, when we talk of standards uh, or research, we should be able to collaborate and ensure that the people on the ground also get that knowledge. And the design, the kind of projects right now we're having at the ARSO level, are standards, when we do standards, we don't simply do the standards, but we are going also to organize training for farmers before you certify them. Those who have, you know, interacted with us, Coffee Enough, I think we have interacted with us uh, for the Ecomark label. You know, we don't simply come and just give you a mark. There's training and assessment to ensure that they do meet, you know, you meet the, the standards. The other point is that, which was very right, that was raised by AFRISAT, that some of these standards uh, that you use for purposes of looking at sustainability, they don't incorporate the aspect of food safety. Our standards include that. So if we are going to assess a food item, we will need to see how you produce that food, what kind of safety uh, precautions you've taken into account, the HACCP system has been placed, and you have to demonstrate that the assembles that have been tested over the duration uh, that you are under, you know, being tested. You, so that we know you have the certificates indicating that you've tested if it is the water has been tested, if it is the product has been tested. You cannot get a certificate if any of those fail. That is how, that's one thing we are going to, you know, we, we are doing and incorporate it into our standards. So that's the difference you'll find between our standards and some of those standards that just deal with eco-labeling without caring about the safety of the product itself. So overemphasis on export is a, is a problem, and I think we have mentioned that, that we also need to look at our own consumption. Markets outside collapse. You've, you've seen that during the COVID era, and you continue to see that. So if you depend on external markets only, 
Yeah, like the tourism industry, which was depending to, so much on tourists from outside, it collapsed. People closed. And we don't want to go into that approach again. So, issues of product classification, as I, as I mentioned, we have the two systems used at the country level. I think that was inherited from the, from the colonial era, still continuing, and we need to do away with it. We have the FCFTA. And when you have the FCFTA, we need to harmonize these standards so that if you have classified your coffee using a harmonized standard, you can sell that coffee from Cote d'Ivoire to South Africa to Mauritius without having to, to also now try to use the European systems or whatever systems. Let's use one system. That's the, that's the purpose of harmonization. Um, I think... With respect to the dictates that are given by the European Union, for example, I think that's an example, not, not necessarily the only thing. Yes, there is this dictate that you cannot go to produce coffee in a place that was a forest, for example, by 1998. So you are not supposed to start a new farm. Seriously, I don't know what that, that is intended to mean. What does it mean? that you cannot expand your production. Does that make sense? Now, that is what happened with the international standards for cocoa, sustainable cocoa, for those who can recall those standards. When they were done by, the, by ISO, they had those dictates that you cannot start planting uh, on a new area that was a forest, I don't know whether by 2005 or something, Cote d'Ivoire and the Ghana said those standards cannot be used in Africa. And they said, they sponsored a committee to work on standards in Africa that are suitable for Africa. Now, it's also very interesting sometimes that you have standards for a product that is exclusively produced in Africa and the standard is being done by Europe. And they are telling you how your farmers should do the work on their farms. Sometimes it's good, but because we can also do those standards, we don't allow them to dictate. If you want to expand your production, use sustainable methods, expand your production. If it's a forest, you know how to do the farming in a sustainable way that does not disrupt the environment. In any case, are you going to stay poor because some people want forests to surround you? Because then they have spoiled their own forests. This is, I don't want to have any controversy. But the fact is that people don't want you to build a house because you are going to destroy a forest. So you are going to sleep where? Where are you going to eat from? Yeah. On their side, they have done whatever they could. They are sleeping well. So here, you are hungry, and you cannot farm because this is a forest you are going to destroy. You can't earn a living because you are going to destroy a forest, and you don't like it. They are our friends, but sometimes there are things they tell us that sometimes we also need to ask them, what exactly do you want us to do? It's a simple question. Negotiate, discuss. Tell them this is not acceptable, unless you give us options. And we can't accept that they are giving us hand, handouts, which are not sustainable anyway. So um, our views, I think, is that we are able to do standards. We are able to look at what is good for us, and we should do that. So, Madam Moderator, I don't want to go into a lot, but the other questions, I think, have been answered. Uh, perhaps if the other panelists have an issue they, they can respond to, I think on my side I will respond. But we are inviting all the member states who are here to participate in our standards harmonization work uh, through, you can get in touch with your national standards bodies. Uh, if you are an organization, IACO is already participating in our uh, standards harmonization for the committee that deals with cocoa, tea, and coffee. And we need to work on these standards to ensure that we add value and we can have harmonized standards that can make our products access markets internal and external. Thank you. Uh, Madam Moderator, if I may.
end, uh, uh, we end up talking about what's in the cup. Um, so this is something that, again, is, is very important just to keep in mind um, as a country when you're, talk when you're discussing about standards. And secondly, I would um, like to also uh, say I completely agree that as producing countries, uh, we need to feel empowered to be able to push back on certain uh, standards that are being imposed upon by consuming countries. Uh, this happens in Africa, it happens in Latin America, it happens in Southeast Asia. Um, and here is a place where we can have what is sometimes called South to South collaboration. And I think uh, it's uh, one of those points where as, together as producing countries, uh, we can actually work together and not isolated Africa on one side, Latin America on the other side, um, Southeast Asia uh, separately. I think these are points of contact where we can uh, converge and have uh, fruitful discussions um, so that uh, in a larger block, we can sit down at a negotiation table um, with those that are wanting to impose certain standards that are good for them, but not necessarily good for the producer. Merci, Monsieur Ortega. Uh, Dr. Ruiz, avez-vous une contribution à, à la discussion? Dr. Ruiz était encore en ligne? Yes, here it is. is always positive. And I think that's the major aspect of any kind of standardization is to create the language that empowers and a language that helps to integrate the whole value change from the beginning, from the base, all the way to the consumer. And I think that is very important to understand in order to create the standards that make sense. Because sometimes we find standards that doesn't make sense for a uh, one part of the industrialization, or when, as it was mentioned before, it's a standard that, yes, is good for some part of the value change, but it's not good for the whole change. So, and I think that part of moving toward copying, be Q greater, be the basic copying standards that CAA used to have, helps to create the language that really provides and empowers the growers and the ones who do the post-harvest processing to understand what they need to do in order to enhance and use the optimum of its own product and resources. Because it was only when I understood myself what they meant by something in the consuming countries that we were able to solve some issues in our own meal that we couldn't that we could have done before, but we never understood what they meant by some things. And I, that's what we need to have this language that is standardized the whole concept so we understand at our own producing countries what is need to be done or what is needed to be done. Thank you. Merci. Merci, uh, Dr. Ruiz. Je remercie encore uh, uh, tous, tous les panélistes pour leur... Uh, leur présentation. Merci à tous pour vos interventions. Merci aux participants pour vos questions qui ont rendu les travaux fructueux. Nous sommes arrivés au terme de cette session. Et euh, merci. Uh, let us applaud the, the panel once again. Thank you, uh, the moderator of the session, Engineer Annapel, Dr. Regina, uh, Mr. Ruben, and the panelists who are virtual. We thank you all. We are coming to the end of the session today. Uh, mine is to announce that uh, after this, we have capping sessions organized where we had the lunch today. These are coffee capping sessions, which will go for about one hour. 
and this is an opportunity for you to test uh, the Cup Kenya coffee to know what kind of coffees we produce. Secondly, after that, we shall have uh, dinner served in the same cupping area. So we invite you for dinner. And like I announced in the morning, the, today's Gara dinner uh, is, is sponsored by the Cooperative Bank of Kenya. So the Co Bank will be there to give you some, 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 some remarks. And at this point, I would want us to adjourn for today and uh, enjoy the cup of coffee outside here, enjoy the cupping of coffee at the dinner area, and enjoy the dinner as we enjoy being in this uh, lovely country, Kenya. Akuna Matata, we say Nikiswairi. So at this point, I would want to adjourn the sitting until tomorrow. So can we get somebody to play to, for closing prayers, please? We have a volunteer there. Give her the microphone. I mean, the, the sp so I think members, thank you for today. Thank you for that honor. Apart from being a coffee farmer, I'm also a priest and apostle in this nation. My name is Apostle Prudence Jackie. Let's bow our head for prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Everlasting Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, touch and agree that you are Lord upon our lives. Thank you for everyone in the sound of my voice. Thank you, Father, dear Lord, it is you who taught us, Father, dear Lord, in the book of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, that you created us in your own image. And in verse 28, you gave us power and authority. How that your Lord to produce, to dominate, and Father, dear Lord, to be fruitful, O King of glory. Thank you for the land. Thank you for the nations that are represented, O King of glory. Father, you have given us, Father, dear Lord, coffee as a produce. How that your Lord to build our economy, O King of glory. Being the producer, how that your Lord encourage us, Father, dear Lord, in the area of leadership. And Father, dear Lord, where we shall, Father, dear Lord, bring knowledge, Father, dear Lord, even to the people on the ground, uh, to the people, Father, dear Lord, on the ground level, O King of glory. Grant us the grace, Father, dear Lord, as uh, grant us the grace to be taught, to understand, and Father, dear Lord, and also that we may receive, Father, dear Lord, the knowledge and wisdom only for your own glory and honor. Father, dear Lord, as we partake and as we participate, for what we shall do here, O King of glory, grant us also more grace, Father, dear Lord, to bring innovations, and Father, dear Lord, to realize ourselves, Father, dear Lord, in every commodity that you have given us, Father, dear Lord, only for your own glory and honor. Receive adoration, receive all the glory. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and believe. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. And as I finish, give me J, give me E, give me S, give me U. That is Jesus. That's my boss. Shalom. Thank you very much, and um, hope to see you at the World of Coffee in Milan in June. Thank you again. Thank you. And for the invitation. Enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you.